Hello everyone, we're back with another collection of the scariest stories found on the internet. I hope you've been enjoying them every week. With Halloween inching closer and closer, the stories will be getting scarier and scarier. Let's not waste any more time and begin our journey into Mr. Creep's mind. I tried to escape the rain in a rundown cabin. It wasn't abandoned. Written by Girl from the Crypt. I'm an avid hiker, and I go after this hobby whenever I can. Despite knowing it would be safer, I don't like talking with people. I make up for it by telling my friends where I'm headed and when to expect me to come back though. This way, if anything should happen to me and I'm unable to call for help, there's always going to be someone who knows that I'm gone and where to look for me. Not that I often go anywhere that's particularly dangerous. I mostly just drive out to this hilly stretch of woodland that's about an hour away from where I live. There are a lot of different signposted trails there and even though I've taken all of them at least once before, I don't mind doing it again. When this happened, I was hiking up a longer path. All the trails that go around in the forest in a loop, so you'll come back out right where you started from. The one I chose involves a pretty steep ascent, so it's slightly more challenging than some of the others. It made me sweat a good deal, but since it wasn't my first time, I was doing just fine. Until it started raining. The weather forecast had predicted nothing but a cloudy sky and mild temperatures, so this was completely out of the blue. It was a strong kind of rain too. Before long, the water was whipping in my face and coming down hard. I needed to get myself somewhere dry or it would start kneading me like dough. Of course, I hadn't brought an umbrella, so I ended up running into the woods for cover. For a while, I crouched down under a big tree, and it did shield me from the rain for a few minutes. I figured I could wait it out, but then there was this loud cracking noise behind me, and I turned just in time to watch a huge branch break off under the tree and crash down below. Without me noticing, the wind had picked up and was now causing the bushes and treetops to shudder violently. I didn't want a branch like that coming down on me, so I hastily rushed back out onto the trail. With how far I had walked already, my only option was to keep walking until I had come back out. Pressing on was difficult. The rain was icy and made me shiver even through my jacket. And then all of a sudden, I remembered there is an old abandoned cabin off to the side a little way up the trail. Hopeful once more, I began to jog, shielding my eyes from the falling water with my hands. As I looked around, trying to locate the small wooden building. Finally, I spotted the structure in the distance and started making my way up to it, praying that it wasn't locked. I rattled on the doorknob. The door swung open with an obedient creak, and I staggered inside before slamming it shut behind me. I dropped my backpack before peeling off my wet jacket and desperately rubbing my arms to warm them up. It was surprisingly warm inside the cabin and pleasantly dry. It smelled like old wood, but nothing I wouldn't be able to ignore. I was beyond relieved that the door had been open. Looking around, I took in my surroundings. There wasn't a lot of furniture left inside. I was standing in what must have been the living room at some point. Judging from the sad looking ragged couch that stood in the middle of it, there was a tiny open kitchen in the back, and also a staircase that probably led down to the basement, but it didn't feel like checking it out. There's a good chance these steps would break down as soon as I had put weight onto them. Turning my attention to the windows, I found that one of them was broke but it had been pieced back together with duct tape. I tentatively gave it a poke with the tip of my finger, which it withstood. I hoped it would outlast the storm. 
The sound of thunder rolling came from outside, and I flinched at how loud it was. I really had been lucky to have made it to the cabin in time. I was hesitant to get comfortable on the couch for fear of the tiny life forms that might have taken up residence inside it over time, but it'd still be to sitting on the floor. So I sank down on these saggy cushions and I took out my cell phone. Of course, I had no reception whatsoever. At least I had some offline games to play while I was waiting for the storm to die down. After half an hour, I realized that wasn't going to happen anytime soon though. I would have to go easy on the battery if I wanted to have some left by the time that I got out of there. So I sat aside my phone and started looking through my backpack for something else to keep myself busy with. I found a worn novel that I had cramped in there and forgotten ages ago, so I started reading. I still had a bunch of snacks and water so I hadn't drank until my stomach felt pleasantly full. The wind was howling outside and I kept hearing thunder clapping. The sky was growing darker too. I noticed that it was getting harder to read with how little light was finding its way into the windows. This concerned me a bit, and I wondered how long exactly I would end up stuck in the cabin. Things were looking pretty grim out there too, and I wasn't too keen on spending the night in this place, even though it did feel kind of adventurous. I continued to read for as long as what remained of the day's light allowed me, but that was hardly another hour. The hut looked spooky in the darkness. It wasn't exactly pitch black, but enough to make me uneasy. The only thing to illuminate the living room was the occasional flash of lightning from outside. I moved over on the couch so I could watch the storm through one of the windows. Thunder rolled once again. And then all of a sudden, a male voice cut through the silence left in its wake. Seven, six, eleven, five, nine and twenty mile today. I jolted upright. For a second, my head had just gone completely empty. And then I glanced around frantically, before realizing that nobody had actually spoken to me. The voice was deep and eerily resonant but it had a crackly undertone to it. It was a recording. But my relief upon realizing that this was short-lived. There was a strange recording playing somewhere nearby, somewhere close to me. Somebody had just turned it on. 4, 11, 17, 32 the day before. The recording stopped. It had only been playing for mere seconds, but I could tell that it was coming from downstairs, from the basement. The abrupt way it had been turned off made me think that whoever was down there had only turned it on accidentally. They would never want me to know that I was not alone. It was only then that I realized I was still sitting on the couch, frozen in place like a statue, staring at the basement entrance. I instantly jumped to my feet and picked up my jacket, struggling to put it on while at the same time, trying to shove my belongings back into my backpack. I had to get out of there. I didn't care about the rain or the lightning or the falling branches anymore. I just needed to get out. And then I heard footsteps. They were hasty, fast, and they were moving up the stairs. Stifling a scream. I abandoned my backpack and simply burst through the door, sprinting out into the cold. Despite the darkness, I could still see the trail ahead, just a small distance away from the cabin. I leapt towards it and when I had reached it, I just kept on running as fast as my legs would carry me. I hurriedly patted down my jacket. I could feel my cell phone, wallet and keys in my pockets which immediately made me feel light with relief. There was also a can of pepper spray somewhere in there, which I figured was better than nothing if, God forbid, whoever had been in the cab would catch up with me. Thankfully, it never came to that. By some miracle, I found my way back to my car. I instantly locked it upon jumping inside. I was completely drenched and utterly exhausted. It took me ages to catch my breath. 
I sat in the car for around half an hour, shaking and crying before finally managing to pull myself together, realizing that I shouldn't hang around. I started driving. I was way too tired to make it all the way back home. So, I just stopped at this dingy little motel that's 15 minutes away from the hiking spot, and I got a room there for the night. I basically collapsed on the bed. I didn't know whether or not to call the police. I've had some bad experiences with the local authorities before, so I decided not to. At least, not right away. It's a trust thing, I guess. What I did do was I called my brother and told him everything, asking him if he and I could go back to the place together to see what was up with it. He readily accepted and we came up with the following plan. My brother, being a huge guy himself, would come pick me up in the morning with one or two of his friends, and we would return to the woods as a group, so no one would try to mess with us. We would go up to the cabin, retrieve my lost belongings and take a look at it, but I also had to promise him that if we were to find evidence of something bad going on there, that we would call the police. He showed up in his truck the following day, as promised with another man with him. We headed back to the hiking spot and made our way up the trail. The storm had left its impact in the woods quite clearly. Broken branches were scattered everywhere, and some of the young, thin and more fragile trees had been knocked over completely, basically torn out by the roots. The cabin, however, had endured. Ed's door was wide open when we reached it. We entered it, one right after the other. I could tell the guys were just as nervous as I was. No doubt, they were taking what I had told them quite seriously. Still, we were all prepared to defend ourselves if someone was to charge at us unexpectedly. My backpack wasn't in the upstairs room, which to me could only mean that somebody had moved it. When my brother said that we would have to go down into the basement, I was understandably reluctant at first, but he reminded me that we had agreed on this earlier so it was too late for me to chicken out. Each stair let out an agonized creak as we put our weight on it, and I feared the rickety old things really would end up breaking down. My brother's friend stayed upstairs so he could get us out in case theft would really happen, but to my surprise it never did. Soon enough, we found ourselves in a room that was just as big as the living room. There was enough light falling in from upstairs for us to see everything, and what we saw was not nice. First, there was the tape recorder. It sat right in the middle of the floor like it had been propped up for us to find right away. My brother went up to it and turned it on. I flinched as I heard the same warped male voice start to speak. It sounded just as eerie as before. My brother's friend suddenly called out to us from upstairs. Is that Boots? What do you mean? I asked. That's Boots. It's this poem by Rudyard Kipling, I think. I don't know who did that reading, but it's creepy as heck. I heard that it's used to simulate bad things or something. Like for Navy SEAL training. I don't know. By the way, it really was Boots. That's why I don't feel the need to transcribe the recording here exactly, since you can just look it up. That was the first thing to give us a really queasy feeling though. While the room was largely empty, a single cardboard box that had been pushed up to the wall stood out. My brother took a look inside without touching it, and then he waved me over. Upon bending down beside him to check it out, I found that it held several rows of duct tape, a bunch of plastic bags, some cable binders and a lot of small gardening tools, like a little hoe, secateurs and a saw. We also found cleaning supplies in another corner of the room, right next to two buckets with plastic lids on top. The second that I opened one of them, a putrid smell came wafting out, strong enough to send me and my brother reeling backwards. I cursed and immediately covered my nose and mouth, hurriedly moving in again to shut the dang thing. But in my haste, I knocked it over. 
and we stumbled aside as a viscous brown and red liquid spilled onto the floor at our feet. Brown and red. Oh crap, come on, we're getting out of here, my brother yelled, grabbing me by the wrist and starting to drag me back up the stairs. That very moment, however, something caught my eye out of a darkened corner of the room. Wait, I told him, pulling my hand out of his grasp and pointing at what I had just seen. It was my backpack, hung up on a nail jutting out of the wall. How would I had noticed it sooner? I had to cautiously step over the pool of red on the floor to reach it, but eventually I managed to grab it and then left back over to my brother. We ran up the stairs and left the cabin with our third companion, and as soon as we were back in the car, he called the police while I began to rummage through my backpack. Everything was how I had left it. Nothing had been taken out. There was something else, though. I found it tucked between the pages of the book that I had been reading. It was this torn-off piece of paper with a brief note scrawled onto it. Just a few words, but enough to make my stomach turn. Slippery little thing. We never should have traveled to the stars. They found Earth. Written by In and Out Person. Five. You need to wake up. Four. Please, they're coming. Three. What do we do, Captain? Two. Open fire. One. Ejecting passenger from cryopod. Those were the first words I heard when I hit the cold metal floor. It was so blurry that I couldn't see anything. And then suddenly, all around me, I heard a voice. It sounded female. It sounded like... Before I could finish my thought, what seemed to be a holograph of a woman appeared in front of me. Sorry for your dramatic re-entrance. I thought the engineers would have installed a rail so you wouldn't go face first into the floor. But that's not important right now. We need you at the bridge ASAP. Where and I... Who are you? Who's we? Where the heck am I? I demand to know where I am. Man, that cryo sickness really did a number on you. It must have caused some form of amnesia. I mean, you weren't even out for that long. You were in there for just a year. A year? Where am I? You're on a UNE exploration ship, proudly named the Spearhead, first of its class. A spaceship? How? Why am I on here? Oh boy, this is bad. Sorry to break it to you, but you're the captain of the ship. The reason you're awake right now is because we were going to broadcast the first successful instantaneous jump to another system to all the people on Earth. It's a big moment for humanity, of course. This is insane. I don't even know who I am. Not even my freaking name. Oh, don't worry. All you have to do is be presentable in front of all of humanity. Make the jump and then you can go back into cryo sleep. Who's going to command the ship then? We have a secondary captain for situations like this. Now here, get dressed. It's almost time. I started getting ready with the clothes this AI gave me. It had a UN logo on it. I don't remember the UN ever having a space for us. Not even an army. I need to find out what is going on. The AI started giving me instructions to the bridge and gave me a table with the script of my speech. I was supposed to give to the rest of humanity. It was a large burden for someone who just came into the world knowing nothing. I walked into the bridge and saw a man and woman rapidly stand up and salute me. Didn't really expect that to be honest. Sir, it's good to see you in good health. Uh, Captain, this is Second Lieutenant Velasquez. He was the top in his class in aeronautics in the United States Air Force and is a master at almost everything. 
Well, almost everything. It chuckled to itself. And this is Cadet Von Deo, a Master of Physics and a Bachelor in Biology from MIT. Quite impressive. Captain. Just by glancing at her for less than a second, I saw she wasn't the military type, unlike Velasquez. Alright, let's get this show on the road. Start the transmission to Earth. Copy that, sir. I saw her starting to press some buttons on her station, and soon a screen showed the insides of the famous UN General Assembly, with all the representatives of the nations of the world waiting for me to speak, and probably the rest of the world was listening too. I started reading my speech. Representatives of the United Nations and all the people of Earth, today is a historical moment for not only the whole that is humanity, but to the future generations of our kind. Today marks the day we as a species venture into the stars to claim them as our own, explore the galaxy and discover the mysterious of the universe. We will become the people of the stars today, and with this new technology, we are able to achieve this, which was unheard of many years ago. So think of the endless possibilities that await us in the future. Today is the step that will lead humanity to great wonders and achievements. Now, let us take that step now. Lieutenant Velasquez set course to the Epsilon Iridani system. Yes, sir. Setting course to the Epsilon Iridani system. We are jumping in five. Four. I started hearing something strange behind me. It sounded like scratching and screeching of something like an animal. Three. Two. I then heard two words in English that made me rethink this whole exploration operation. Turn back. One. Jump. What I saw turned my insides out. It was so beautiful and yet so terrifying. So many colors went by so fast and in an instant, everything turned black. No stars. Just pure blackness. And then... It spoke a sentence to me, but I didn't know what type of language it was, but it sounded so familiar. Ingressus S. Stamin. Suddenly, we dropped out of the void and entered real space again. Sir, by the computer's calculations, we are ten and a half light years away from the Sol system. We have made it to the Epsilon Iridani system. It worked. He exhaled his shaking breath. We were all excited, but what we expected was what we got. A couple of rocky, barren worlds and two gas giants. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't expecting a lush planet. But nevertheless, I shouldn't get my hopes up. But what concerned me the most was that voice. What was it warning me about? Maybe in some way, it's connected with my memory loss. Before I could ponder it any longer, I was interrupted by Velasquez. Sir, orders. I'll take it from here, Lieutenant, stated the AI. Miss Vaughn, may you take the captain to the sickbay and examine him for any anomalies. Precautions are essential since, if there is any sign of trouble there, are no reinforcements coming to rescue us. Why me? I'm not a doctor, not even a medic. Can't you do it? If you are able to conduct these types of trivia tasks, can't you? I need to make sure the radiation from our job doesn't melt our armor and expose us to the vacuum of space. As your commanding lieutenant, I order you to stop bickering and to do what it tells you, cadet. Yes, sir. I was then escorted down the hall by Miss Vaughn to the med bay, presumably to examine the mystery that is my amnesia. I felt that she didn't like taking orders with an intelligence not of human origin, so I took the initiative. Having just achieved the greatest leap for humanity, you don't seem overly joyed, Miss Vaughn. You can call me Alyssa, Captain. I'm not so strict as a Mr. Lieutenant over there. You can say that again, I laughed, and I turned to her still laughing, and she smiled. I took her for such a serious person, 
I kind of forgot she was human. Come on, uh, let's get you to the med bay. I had totally forgotten that. We were in space and there was no gravity. So, when I saw that walking was an easy task, I thought that were a form of inertial dampeners being activated. This is too much. Can I ask you something? She nodded to my question. What year is it? The year, it's 2023. Thank you. I could tell some suspicion was starting to arise between us, but then, out of the corner of my eyes, the medbay. Honestly, on first glance, it looked more of like a laboratory than a medical bay. Advanced machinery, hollow projectors, and advanced medication to cure almost all diseases known to man. It was incredible. I need you to lie down here, please. She led me to the bed with advanced scanning equipment above it. Maybe it was to scan my brain or do basic surgeries, like in that movie, Prometheus. I laid down on the bed and the machine started moving up and down, adjusting and measuring. After about two minutes, the machine retreated to its original position. Then I got up and started walking to Alyssa, but her expression frightened me. Hey, you okay? What's wrong? I then turned to see the screen she was observing. What I saw caused me to become null of reaction. It was a worm-like organism. It was small but noticeable. It was near my cerebellum, wiggling around as if making room. Before I could react and look at Alyssa, I was not unconscious. Slowly, I started becoming conscious again, but I wasn't in the med bay. Not even in the ship. All I saw was white, and it was blinding. I fell on my knees from the pain. What felt like years, the lights vanished, and I heard a voice. At first, it was speaking an unknown language, and I tried responding, but it was useless. And then slowly, it started speaking English. Mewman, you have crossed a line you were not ready for. What business do you have here? What are you talking about? Crossed what line? You have crossed thy warp. An area of space far beyond your comprehension. And these actions do have harsh consequences. Consequences? We've done nothing wrong. We came all this way and for what? Just so you, what if you are, stop us? You clearly have never met humanity. You misunderstand. We are trying to help you. However, you have unintentionally caused chaos to grow throughout the timeline that is your universe. Chaos? How? How do you know this? What are you? We are called the Ones. Beings from long ago that have died out many thousands of years ago. We have seen your kind. We see it great promise but also... Great disaster as well. But you have caused the line to shatter. The reason we are here is to keep you on the path. If you stray from the path, we cannot predict the future and in turn protect humanity. We do not have much time. We are sorry, but you have made this your fate. What? Are you going to kill us? No. There is a reason why humanity was not supposed to achieve FTL during this time. Only after 13,000 years will humanity be safe to travel the stars. I am deeply sorry, but if you survive this trial, you must heed my warning, human. Beware the... My surroundings became blurry, and the white void started to dissipate. Beware who... Don't go, please. Beware who. Answer me. Slowly, my vision came back to me and I found myself back on the medical bed. I felt like I was hit with five concussions all at once. And I sat up and I was greeted by Alyssa with a friendly hug. Thank God you made it out safely. What happened? I was half awake. You fell unconscious, so I rushed you to the surgery bed and got whatever that thing was out of your head. I made sure to kill it and injected it out. I need to see Velasquez. 
I think we're in trouble. I saw. Before I could finish my sentence, the ship's intercom came on. It was Velasquez, and he sounded panicked. I need both of you up here ASAP. Now. Stay here. You need to rest. I'll go check what the idiot wants. No, I'm the captain of the ship. I'll be fine. Let's go. With hesitation, she nodded in agreement, and we started sprinting to the bridge. What's going on? I said aggressively. Sir, we have multiple objects appearing at the edge of the solar system. I saw primal fear on his face. The ones. This is what they were talking about. We have ten, no, sixty, no, two hundred objects at the edge of the Iridani system, sir. Zoom in on the objects. We need to observe what we're dealing with. The screen showed pixels of hundreds if not thousands of objects. With some enhancement, what I saw shocked me to the core. Those weren't ships. Those were organisms. Mile-long biomasses. That's impossible. Nothing that size can live in space. Sir, they seem to have spotted us. Should I jump back to Earth? No, I shouted. They could track us back, and we can't risk that. Screw this. Screw you. I'm taking us back home. Are you insane? We can't lead them back to our home. I'm not dying here. I have a family. Jump sequence initiated. Commencing instantaneous jump in five, four, three. You idiot. You'll end all of humanity. I charged to the station to cancel that order. He got up and tackled me before I could get to the controls. It didn't help. I had just got out of surgery, too. Two. One. Before I could hit any serious blows, all three of us looked up to the main screen of the bridge and I saw five words that crushed all of my hope. Jump unsuccessful. Subspace anomaly detected. Behind the air display, we saw those things getting closer and closer. Putting our fight aside, we checked to see if the system was working properly. Second time error. Third time error. The fourth time was an error too. Do we still have a sublight engines? I asked. We do, but... Shut up and get us out of here. Move to the nearest gas giant and hide behind the dark side of the planet. Sir, we have incoming vessels. Too fast to be intercepted with our defenses. Fire the autocannons. Brace for impact. These smaller craft were accelerating towards us at high speeds, but they weren't firing any projectiles. Too big to be missiles. They're boarding craft. They zipped past the bridge and soon we heard an alarm. Hull breach in sections 4 and 9. Multiple organisms rushing toward the reactor. We need guns now. We can't let them access the database and find Earth. Erase everything and send a warning to Earth now. Alyssa started typing rapidly at her station. Sending transmission to Earth. I could hear her silent cries. Here, sir, take this. Five mags for me and you, and two for Alyssa. I received a G-36C, and he got a M-249, while Alyssa was given a Glock. Me and Velasquez set up positions and sealed the protective door, which separated the whole ship from the bridge. The aliens had made it to the reactor. They are tearing it apart. Luckily, the fusion drive will not cause an explosion. I'm sorry. It's been an honor, sir. The honor is all mine. The power to the ship disconnected and the bridge was in total darkness. We turned on our flashlights and prepared for our soon final moments, aiming our weapons at the door. It's been an honor, sir, said Velasquez. I looked at him. Likewise, Lieutenant. Faintly, we heard the sound of screams hissing in hunger from those things, and then it stopped. We got ready, only looking at the door. If I just knew sooner, I could have saved him. Within seconds, the foundation where the lieutenant's was located collapsed. He fell and God had the sounds. His screams and these sounds of being devoured alive. It shook me to the core. 
I started opening fire at the hole full of those Zenos. There were so many of them. Once my mag was empty, I stood in shock. All I saw left was blood. His screams continued even as the monsters left and headed deeper into the vents. I looked at Alyssa to see if she was alright but her face. The red dripping down her face. The glock on the floor. The single bullet case on the floor. I looked away and fell to my knees. I screamed in anger and in sadness. The rage inside me was boiling up. And soon, I heard them again. Dozens of them came out of the vent and covered the walls of the bridge. I stood still and so did they. Soon, a creature that seemed to command these swarmers came out of the vent and approached me standing at about seven feet tall while hunched back. I was taken aback. Was this one going to personally take me out or eat me? I wouldn't go down without a fight. As if in unison, they all said in broken English, you should have never crossed the warp. I raised my gun and they started screaming. I fired every last bullet into those things, using my rage to keep taking them out even after half my body was gone. I was eaten alive. Before I was completely gone, the large alien approached me, grabbed me by the ribs as I screamed in pain. He held me close and he opened his jaw. Everything was black. Out of nowhere, that same familiar voice started echoing all around me. The correction has been placed, and the line has become uncrossed once again. Humanity will be safe for now. But remember, beware those that call. Doctor, doctor, he's waking up. Let me see. Go get some food and water ready. He's gaining consciousness. Welcome back, Mr. Anderson. Where am I? You're at a hospital in downtown LA. You were involved in a deadly construction accident. We have contacted your family. They're on their way as we speak. My family? Yes, they're on their way. Don't worry, your injuries have healed and you will be released soon. Excuse me, I am needed elsewhere. Me left in a hurry proudly to tend to another patient. My family soon arrived in a matter of minutes. I was later told that I was involved with a vehicle explosion during the construction of these spearheads propulsion systems. Once I had returned home, I immediately went to my laptop and searched up any news on the spearhead. It was worse than I expected. We lost contact with them 12 hours ago, but the most disturbing news... Apparently, three rescue ships were sent to recover the spearhead. However, they found the spearhead in a destroyed state located at the edge of the solar system. The more closely I look at it, the more I see those things looking back at us. This was published 30 minutes ago. I am writing to whoever is reading this to understand that there are things in the universe that we are not prepared for whatsoever. But there is another thing. Every time I had a vision about the ones, their sentence would cut off, right at the end. Well, when I saw the photo of the destroyed spearhead, I had another vision, but this one didn't cut off. Here's the full message. Interpret this as you will. Hear me, human. We do not have much time left, but heed our final warning. Beware those they call. Tyranids. When you go camping, beware the watchers. Written by 02321. I adamantly refuse to ever go camping again. This happened years ago when I was still in my teens, but I can still remember it clear as day. I was loosely a part of the air cadets after school. I didn't even have a uniform. They just let me hang out with a friend of mine and take part in some of the events. Since she was always busy with cadets, I wouldn't see her if I didn't go. But I didn't want to join myself. I wasn't the military type. They made you stand at attention and remember ranks. It wasn't for me. 
I just helped them set up for fundraisers or help clean up the meeting hall as an excuse to see my best friend. And then the camping trip came up. I wasn't really a cadet, but they said if I wanted, that I could come along on the trip. We would need to do things like learn how to build shelters in the woods, and first aid as survival exercises. We could even take turns going up into a small two-seat plane on the trip. My parents liked the idea of me learning something new, and I liked the idea of sharing a town with my friend for a weekend. We never got to see each other anymore. Her parents wanted her to be doing a million extra things after work. I swear if she wasn't doing cadets, it would be a part-time job or two after school. The first day went perfectly fine. We all worked together setting up the tents into the camp. After lunch, they broke us into groups to practice at building shelters. I think it was for a badge or something like that. Because I wasn't really in the program, they let me just hang out with my friends as long as I didn't help them. I couldn't help even if I wanted to. I didn't even have the basic understanding of outdoor survival. Just being there was slowing them down. So instead, I gathered sticks I thought might be useful for them to use. While I was out on my own, but still at a friend group visible, I noticed some strange scratch marks on some trees. Deep, fresh cuts scarred the bark. I pointed it out, asking if there were any bears around, but they all shook their heads. Everyone was confident there were no large animals in the woods that were dangerous. I gave the marks one last worried look, and went back with the group to drag down their progress again. By the end of the night, we were all tired and cold. No one told me that it was going to be this cold out. My friend saw me shivering and let me borrow a sweater. I saw the brief look of hesitation on her face before she handed it to me. Aside from being tired and needing to do all these tasks, I was enjoying myself a little. That was until I accidentally heard the cadets talking when I was coming back from a bathroom break. Why did they even let her come along? One of them asked my friend. My breath caught and I waited for her to stick up for me. She doesn't have anything else to do and besides, she's not that bad. Not that bad? What did that mean? Did my friend agree with them that I had some bad traits? I mean, I wasn't on the same skill level as the rest of them, but I still thought we could all have fun that weekend. The only way to rescue this trip is to have her do all the chores and keep her busy, while we do what we came here for. This voice sounded a bit nastier than it had any reason to be. I'll see what I can do. That was it then. A good friend of mine was turning on me. I was a burden in everyone's eyes and I never should have come along. Walking into camp, they all noticed me and shut up really fast. I was given some fake smiles and I played along with it. I shouldn't make them hate me any more than they already did. I just needed to get through that weekend and never come back to hang out with the cadets again. When night fell, we had no set bedtimes, but I only stayed by the fire for a little while. I turned in early to let everyone else chat and talk without me. Inside the tent was so cold. I wish someone told me the weather so I could pack better. After a while, I heard my friend come into the tent silently. I think she knew that I was aware of what they all said earlier, but wanted to pretend that it never happened. That was fine by me. My plan was to pretend that I was fast asleep until I actually was asleep. After a while of silently being curled up in the dark, I came to the horrible realization that I had to pee. That meant getting out of my somewhat warm sleeping bag into the cold. I thought that I heard some rustling of animals outside my tent, but I forced myself to think it was my imagination. I would also risk waking up someone to borrow a flashlight. Because the moon was so bright, I decided on going outside without one. As silently as possible, I got out of the tent, slowly zipping it up behind me. I shuddered in the chill air and started to power walk towards where a porta potty was set up. 
I didn't want to be out there for any longer than I had to. I knew the path by heart, but everything looked so strange in the dark. I started to doubt about going the right way. I was so focused on staying on the path that I didn't notice a strange flickering red lights in front of me. When I did see them in the bushes, I froze. I squinted, trying to get a better look at what I was seeing. All at once, I just knew. They were eyes. Red eyes staring at me from the leaves. Slowly, they started to rise up as if whatever was looking at me was standing. And I ran. I felt a jolt of fear as I stupidly ran off into the woods. I kept running until my lungs burned and I tripped on an exposed root. Only when I had stopped moving, what I just did fully sunk in and I started to feel pathetic. Mine gotten lost. Gosh dang it, I was lost in the middle of the woods. I never should have gone on this horrible and good for nothing trip. I was uh, just bringing everyone down with me. I haven't given my full effort my entire life and now I was going to die in the woods because of it. At least I was lost with a bunch of somewhat trained cadets in the area. If I fell and broke my leg, they would knew what to do if I was found. If. The idea kept playing in my head. If I was found. People go missing all the times in the woods and they're never seen again. Lost people fall off of cliffs and get eaten by the wildlife. Or they starve to death and then get eaten by wildlife. Or the wildlife didn't wait for nature to take its course and just eat the hopelessly lost still alive. I didn't have any training. Heck, I couldn't even build a shelter correctly. Unless someone found me, I would die out here. A bit of a jump for someone who was only lost for a short while. But being in the woods in the dead of night, an hour felt like years. Too scared to walk further. I sat against a tree, feeling miserable and so alone in the dark. I rubbed my arms together to try and stay warm. I just needed to last until morning when people could start looking for me. I was with a bunch of people who knew what to do in this situation. Feeling sorry for myself, I sat getting colder by the second. And I heard something that turned my stomach to ice. A yipping off in the distance. I knew coyotes might live in the woods and I did not want to find out. I debated on if it was better to stay put or leave. I didn't want to run across them to get mauled. I needed a plan. After calming down, I decided that I would make a fire. It would keep me warm and maybe the smoke would alert anyone who was looking for me. Getting up, I started looking for a clear space in the dark. The moon was almost full, making it easy to see. I found a small clearing close by and started brushing away leaves the best that I could. I didn't want to set the entire forest ablaze. I knew the idea of how to start a fire, but I had never done it before. Once my spot was decided on, I gathered some rocks circling my clear space, as if it would keep the flames enclosed. Looking around, I started to gather sticks that I felt to be dry enough to be useful. With an armful of sticks, I heard a noise. Twigs breaking behind me. I don't know why, but I thought it was someone coming to save me. It was a stupid thought. A wild animal was more likely. And that's exactly what it was. When I turned around, I was facing a massive bear just staring at me. Some of my gathered sticks tumbled out of my arms, but otherwise, I didn't move. There was no fight or flight in me. I just froze. My mind turned blank. No advice on how to deal with bears came. I only thought of one thing. I was going to die. Simple as that. It was a shock of how quickly I accepted that fate. I stood unable to move. My breathing shortening until I was taken in quick, painful gasps. The bear started to take some waddling steps towards me and I still didn't move. When it stood up on its back legs, a few more sticks fell from my arms from how badly my hands were shaking. Tears came to my eyes as I begged my body to do something, no matter how useless that might be. Finally, in the back of my mind... I heard someone telling me, if it's a brown bear, you should make a noise. Wait, was that right? 
What is a Blackburn noise you made to scare it off? I was useless. I couldn't even remember the dang advice to save my life. I thought of my friends. I really hoped that this bear ate every part of me and I was never found. I didn't want them to come across my body. I saw the bear start to move a paw towards me and I nearly fainted. I jumped when a flurry of motion came from the bushes next to us. A blur came from out of the trees, slamming so hard against the bear that it knocked the thing over. I sat in disbelief. There was nothing that could take on a bear besides another bear. Nothing natural, that is. The spell was finally broken and I darted back, tripping and falling painfully on my backside. Red and fur flew as the bear roared, trying to fight off the attacker. It was being hit by something smaller than it, but it was still losing. My mouth hung open, watching the fight in the dark. The moon came out from behind a cloud and I could get a better look at what had accidentally come to my rescue. I didn't believe it. I just couldn't. The beast raised a head and I could see it clearly. A wolf's head swiftly moving to bite down into the bear's throat. I was watching a fight between a bear and a werewolf. There was no other way to say it. The wolf's body was human-like, covered in dark black fur. Muscles rippled under the fur, powerful enough to take on something as strong as a bear. A long tail thrashed around in the fight. The back claws looked wolf-like, but the front was almost like human hands but with razor-sharp nails gripping onto the brown fur. It dug in fingers deep into the bear's flesh, red seeping out in both creatures screaming. I should have run for it. I had no business being there and yet my body was still frozen by fear. If the bear somehow won, it might eat me after it finished off the werewolf. If the werewolf won, it would eat me for sure. I was a tasty little dessert for either of these two. I could only hope that they took each other out. I heard a horrible cracking sound and one last grunt from the bear as the werewolf tightened its jaws deeply into the bear's neck. The massive brown animal fell still, and the wolf kept its jaws clamped down, breathing heavily. I watched amazed as the claw marks and wounds from the fight started to heal on the wolf's body. In a few minutes, they had all closed up, making it look good as new. Releasing its jaw, it stood up on strong back legs, head pointed up in the air. The wolf let out a victory howl so loud, it rattled my bones. To my horror, I heard more howling answering back in the distance. There were more of these creatures in the woods. After it finished howling, it turned its head and red eyes and found me. Slowly, it faced me only a few feet away. I was still shaking, but not as much as before. Thank you. My voice was so low and trembling that I could barely hear myself. Large ears twitched in my voice. I couldn't tell what kind of expression it had aside from scary. Looking from between me and the bear, it made a choice. Getting on all fours, it took the bear by the neck once again and started to drag it into the woods, disappearing with its meal. I watched it leave, but the relief didn't hit me until the sun started to rise. I sat. Staring at the spot that I had last seen the wolf as the sky started to lighten up. When my campmates finally did find me, they were all in a panic. Our adult supervisors were going to call in some professionals, but they came across me within an hour of my best friend noticing me missing. It was a little embarrassing getting lost so close to camp. They were all glad that I had stayed put and didn't keep going further into the woods making it nearly impossible for them to find me. I never told them why I was so scared into staying in the same spot for most of the night. Not until this point, I haven't told anyone what I saw. I soon fell out of touch with my best friend that I went on that trip to see. Our lives just became too different. Because of that one camping trip, I became a city person and refused to ever go into the woods again. I stayed at a campground with some strange rules, written by 
02321. The rolling mountains and densely packed forests of southwest Montana are truly a place where a person could feel alone. Second only to the isolation I experienced in Alaska during my army days. Excluding Yellowstone and Big Sky, this region is sparsely populated, but in the best kind of way. I hadn't had a vacation in at least three years, a real one. I hadn't been counting the weekend trips to Spokane or Crudeline or Helena. The Montana Highway Patrol had stationed me in Missoula three years ago, right out of field training. I enjoyed Missoula. It kept me busy enough, but I was ready for a break. The schedules finally aligned and I had enough seniority to take off 14 straight days. During my time in Missoula, I had been able to explore Glacier National Park, as well as Flathead and Kootenai National Forest fairly well. So I set my sights on Yellowstone. I had been back to the area since I was a kid, 10 years old or so, a family vacation or something. I didn't remember much of it. I had some campsites reserved inside the park itself, but also some in the surrounding Gallatin National Forest. I figured I would save some money on hotels and just a tent instead, since I was saving up to buy a house. I packed up all my camping supplies into my truck, as well as my faithful canine companion, Tango. Tango was a three-year-old Siberian husky, smart as a whip and with more energy than a nuclear reactor. He was a good companion and the best boy. After about a six-hour drive, we arrived at the first campground near Earthquake Lake. I went to my reserve campsite and found that it was occupied. I went and talked with the elderly couple that were the hosts for the campground. They apologized profusely, as some glitch in their reservation system had double-booked the campsite, and I was just too late. There were no other sites in the campground available either. They offered me a full refund and a voucher for a free stay at another campground just down the road. They were positive this campground would be open and have sites for the next three nights. I thought it was a bit of a long shot since it was at peak tourist season. All the campsites were booked everywhere. I took the refund and the voucher, figuring I would at least check the place out before I drove to Big Sky to pay $300 per night for a hotel. Hollywood's Campground was the name. It was about a 10 minute drive from the previous site, nestled in dense lodgepole pines far off the main highway. The campground was quite beautiful. There was a small river along the southern end of the campground, with a sheer mountain face on the opposite bank. The forest around it was thick and hard to see through. The towering lodgepoles were packed together as densely as I had ever seen them. I had never heard of this place before. It hadn't come up in any of my searches when I was planning my trip months ago. As I was driving into the camp, I first noticed a permanently placed RV right at the center, sitting out front with a sign that read, Welcome to Howling Woods. Please knock. Host always on duty. I got out of my truck and followed these signs instructions. After hearing some shuffling, an extremely elderly woman opened the door. She had skin tanned by a lifetime of working in the sun, and her once jet black hair had more gray in it than black. She squinted at me through wary brown eyes and offered me a toothless smile. I explained my situation and showed her the voucher. Oh, of course. Go ahead and pick out a spot and then come back and check in. I'll get some pamphlets for you. Her accent was Native American. And I got back in my truck and found a decent spot. The site was a clear and flat, with enough trees between the other sites that I could have some privacy. It was also close to the bathroom and the dumpster. A fire ring and a bear box sat in the middle of the small clearing with a small picnic table just off center. The site was on the outer edge of the loop, 
so that the back of the site faced the open wilderness. I parked the tuck and slapped on Tango's leash. We took a long, lazy walk back to the host while I scoped out the other campers. From what I could tell, the campground was about three quarters full, an oddity for this time of year. The sites on both sides of me were occupied, one by a friendly middle-aged couple with Utah plates on their RV, and three Maltese ankle biters running circles around it. They waved at me and I chatted with them for a bit. They told me that this was their second honeymoon, after all eight of their children had finally moved out. The other site was temporarily home to a couple of 20-something guys, who didn't look up from their pipe when I passed them. The strong, skunky smell made me a bit sick as I passed. When I got back to the host, she had me fill out a simple sign-in sheet with my site number, name, and license plate. Then she handed me a small pamphlet about local hiking trails, a flyer about bear safety, and a small handwritten note. Intrigued, I opened up the note. In practiced cursive script, it said, Campground rules. Please extinguish all fires at dusk. Do not leave your tent or camper after dark. If you must leave your tent or camper after dark, do not use any light source. Move quickly and quietly. If you are walking at night and hear something behind you, do not run. Do not look back. Just ignore it. Do not make any loud noises after dark. If you hear anything moving outside of your tent or your camper at night, do not look at it. Stay in your shelter. Howls, barks, grunts and snorts are just local wildlife and nothing to worry about. Earplugs are provided by the host free of charge. Do not leave any pets outside at night. Lock all doors on your vehicles and campers. Lock your tents if possible. Padlocks can be bought from the host. Do not leave the established trails or roads for any reason. Do not ever talk about what you see or hear in this campground. Odd set of rules, I commented. She looked up at me, a flash of anger across her old brown eyes. Her wrinkled brow furrowed. Faster than I thought possible, she lashed out and wrapped her bony fingers around my fist. Follow them, they are important, was the only explanation that she offered. There was a seriousness in her eyes that I had never seen before in anyone. And then she released her vice grip on my wrist. Okay, definitely. So, why is it called the Howling Woods? I've never heard of this place. The wildlife in this forest makes a lot of noise at night. It is quite a spectacle, but it is very important never to interact with them. You'll scare them off. Or worse, she explained. I thanked her for her help and set off back to my campsite, shoving the papers in my back pocket. I returned to the campsite, pitched the tent, loaded all the food into the bear box, and started a small fire. I drank a couple of Budweiser's and roasted some hot dogs over the open flames. I popped open a book and read a few chapters and drank a few more beers. Dusk snuck up on me pretty fast. I cleaned up the mess and took out my phone to check the weather. I had no cell service, but that certainly wasn't a surprise in this country. I took the beer cans to the nearest dumpster and did my best at the vault toilet. It was just getting dark as I got back to my tent. I chained up Tango while I got the tent ready, turning on my electric lantern. While I was laying out the sleeping bag, Tango barked. Tango, like most huskies, had a personality. He had quirks like a human does. He was a talker and would often howl and talk back to me in that strange husky noise but he only ever barked when he was scared. I jumped almost through the top of the tent. I grabbed a can of bear spray and a flashlight from my nearby pack and tore out the front flap of the tent. Tango was cowering under the picnic table, visibly shaking. I had never seen this before. I shined the flashlight around the clearing and saw nothing. Beyond the cone of light, the woods were dark. The lodgepoles scattered the beam, 
making it hard to see anything beyond the clearing. I coaxed him out from under the table and ushered him inside the tent. His tail was between his legs and he was shaking. A year ago, Tango and I were about six miles deep on a backcountry trail in the Kootenai National Forest. We turned a corner on the trail and came face to face with a grizzly. Tango nearly pulled me face first into the dirt in an attempt to run at the bear, utterly fearless and completely oblivious to the size of it. Seeing him react in such a way now made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But I forced myself to think nothing more of it though. I figured the bear had just caught him by surprise and had run off when it heard me coming. I turned off the lantern and settled into my sleeping bag, still a bit unnerved. However, the beers and exhaustion eventually aided sleep in coming fast enough. I wasn't sure how long I had been asleep. When Tango barked again, I sat straight up. Every hair on his body was pulled straight up and his eyes were transfixed on the front flap of the tent. Still, coming out of my deep sleep state, it took me a second to hear it. The sound of the front flap of the tent being unzipped. In the dark, I could barely make out the zipper moving slowly. Gun or bear spray flashlight, the options raced through my groggy brain. I reached for my duffel bag and drew out my Glock 20 from its holster. I always kept it with me out in the wilderness as a last resort for bear defense. I flicked on the weapon mounted lights and shouted, Stop what you're doing or you will be shot. The zipper stopped moving. I could just vaguely see the silhouette of what looked like a large person crouched on the opposite side of the flap. Tango began to growl this time, posturing for a fight. And then suddenly, the silhouette was gone. I could hear something large tear off into the distant brush behind the tent. I barreled out of the flap, gun in hand and Tango right on my heels. I shined the light around the clearing, again seeing nothing. Tango stood transfixed and staring at the certain point out in the dark woods. His hackles were still raised and a low growl emerged from his throat. Oh, what the heck? The chilly wind and frosty mountain air drove me back into the tent quickly. I set my gun back in the pack. My hands were shaking. What the heck was that? I asked Tango. He stared at me, his blue eyes offering no answers. The rest of the night, I laid in my sleeping bag. Sleep would not come to me this time the adrenaline refusing to leave my system. And to make things worse, the howling had started. A chorus of bone-chilling howls arose through the night air. They didn't sound like wolf or coyote. I had never heard anything like it, and all the nights that I had spent in the mountains. It went on for hours, making sleep impossible. The howls started far off, but eventually... It sounded like these sources had moved into the campground. I could hear them coming from different directions, some close to my tent, some far away. One that sounded like it was right behind my tent, loud, almost ear-splitting, a ghostly, mournful howl. I gripped my pistol tight, waiting for something to happen, but then it just stopped. It all stopped. Eventually, the light of day began to show through the walls of the tent. I prodded Tango awake, telling him that if I was awake, he had to be too. I pulled on some warm clothes and exited the tent. Sitting at my picnic table was the elderly woman that hosted the campground. I jumped back, reaching towards my right hip for a gun that wasn't there out of reflex. In a calm, soft tone, she said, you broke the rules. What? You broke the rules. You had your dog out past dark. You used a lantern past dark. You were out of your tent past dark. You didn't lock your tent. Yeah, so? Those rules are there for a reason. To keep you from attracting unwanted attention. 
Uh, attention from what? The creatures of the woods. Something tried to open my tent. No animal can do that. Would you like to buy a padlock? I sighed. Yeah, sure. She reached into her purse and tossed one to me. Five bucks. I fished through the tent until I found my wallet and handed over a five dollar bill. Follow the rules, she stated one more time, befitting getting up and walking away. I stood there for a bit, pondering what the last eight hours had entailed. Tango whined at his food bowl and snapped me back into the real world. I took out my griddle and made some eggs and bacon. Tango looked at his bowl of kibble and then at me with his sad eyes. And I broke down and scooped some of the eggs into his bowl. The marijuana enthusiasts at the next site over were talking about the howls one last night. Stating that they were freaking sketchy bro. I nodded in agreement to myself. I cleaned up camp and changed into some hiking clothes. I loaded up the dog and the day pack into the truck and went off to find some hiking trails. Me exhausted, after a day of about 15 miles of hiking, I collapsed into my camp chair. I had about two hours before dusk. Rattled from the night's previous events, I figured I would strictly hold myself to the rules for the rest of my stay. I had considered leaving, but the campground was gorgeous and free. A hotel nearby would cost 600 bucks or more for a two-night stay. I figured if I followed the rules like the host said, I would be fine. Camp was cleaned and the tent was arranged long before the sunset. Tango and I were bedded down and comfy cozy when dark came. I looped the padlock through the holes in the zippers of the tent flap and I locked it. My Glock was set directly next to my sleeping bag, along with a spare mag. I read a few chapters in my book while Tango started snoozing. The howling started around 10 p.m. A cacophony of strange howls almost moans. Twelve full minutes of this. I almost enjoyed them, listening as they would get closer, hearing them move around the camp. Wolves or coyotes, I assumed. Nothing else could make a noise like that, and Tango didn't even seem to be perturbed by them tonight. Once they had stopped, I snuggled deeper into my bag, ready for sleep. A light rain came down, and I could hear it splatter off the rain fly on the tent. And then came the worst feeling that could possibly come. I gotta freaking go to the bathroom. I should have known better. I should have brought an empty bottle into the tent or something. I never thought of it. I let it tangle, sprawled out and snoring. Am I really gonna do this? I asked Tango. He snored in response. I pulled on a hoodie and slipped on my slides. Pausing, I dig around for the list and I double check. No light, got it. The bathroom was a hundred or so yards away if I walked the road. I figured that was the safer option without light. I contemplated taking my gun, but I had no way to carry it. and The waistband of my sweatpants wouldn't keep it in place. I opted for the bear spray and I shoved it in my pocket. Tango didn't even wake up as I slept out of the tent. I took the padlock off and then relocked the tent from the outside, making sure nothing would bother my buddy. I struggled with leaving him alone in the tent, but the rule said no pets out after dark. I made my way easily enough to the vault toilet and did my business. As I was leaving, the dew-covered dirt handle slipped, and the door loudly slammed shut. Crap. I whispered under my breath. I broke another rule. I started my walk back to the tent. I could hear something moving in the dense forest beside me. I ignore it. I kept walking. And then it stopped as soon as it had begun. Or at least, I thought it did. After a few steps, I noticed that I could hear soft footsteps behind me, but only when I stopped. My heart started pounding. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. A chill ran down my spine. Ignore it. 
It seemed like it was timing its own steps to match mine. It purposefully was making sure I didn't know it was there. It's stalking me. Ignore it. Follow the rules. Every fiber of my being told me to run. I knew that it wouldn't do me much good running these slides. I gripped the bear spray tight in my hand. Its steps were getting louder. It was gaining on me. I finally reached the tent. I now doubt to unlock the padlock fumbling in the dark. I could feel it behind me. My hands were shaking. It was taking forever to enter the combination. It exhaled. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. Ignore it. Finally, the lock popped open. I unzipped the flap just enough for me to squeeze in and shut it quickly behind me. I dove for the gun and quickly pointed it at where I thought it was, careful not to turn on the light. Silence. I reached forward and put the lock back in, struggling to do so with one hand, while the other hand held the gun out in front of me. The lock snapped shut. Silence. Movement. Walking. It was walking away. Trudging through the undergrowth away from the tent. In the pitch black, I didn't see Tango walk up and lick my face. And good boy, back to sleep. He obeyed, circling his spot three times and collapsing once more. I took a few minutes for the shaking to stop, and then a few more minutes for me to put the gun back down. Sleep came slowly, not fast enough. I could hear the door of the camper next door open. The Mormons. Well, I guess I assumed there were Mormons. They were letting their dogs out by the sound of it. Bad idea. The dogs yipped and yapped, even wandering over to my sight. I could hear one panting and sniffing a few yards from my tent. The panting and sniffing became barking and growling, and the barking and growling turned to yelping and whimpering. Tango shot straight up, his eyes fixed at the point in the tent wall where the sound was coming from. I dived at him, wrapping my arms around his snout to keep him from making any noise. Shh, boy, be quiet. I could hear movement. The yelping dog was running around my campsite, through it. It was getting further away and now it was coming back, yelping all the way. And then, there was a much larger rush of movement, and the yelping stopped. The RV door opened, and it sounded like the other two dogs scampered up the stairs. Lucy, Lucy, the man called. Bad idea number two. A light slashed through my tent. He must have turned on a flashlight to look for the dog. I could hear him walk down the stairs and start trudging through the undergrowth. Number three. Eric, come inside. Lucy will be fine. I'm sure she's just exploring. A female voice called out. His wife. Yeah, yeah. He trudged up these stairs and the door closed. I released my grip on Tango, and he licked my face again. I couldn't hear anything else moving around. Ignore it. I ignored what I just heard and tried to go back to sleep. It came easier than it should have and the bliss of slumber washed over me. Morning came faster than it had any right to. I got dressed and took Tango outside. He did his business in the bushes and padded back over to me. I noticed a bit of red on his front right paw. Ah, oh, bud, what happened there? I knelt down and examined his paw. I couldn't find any cuts or sores. And then I noticed he had something on his back paws too. And then it clacked. I stood up and walked over to the spot where Tango had done his business. It was about ten yards behind my tent in the undergrowth. A smear of red covered the ground. Red and white fur. Red splattered painted the trunks of the lodgepoles surrounding the area. Oh... Lucy, it was too early. The couple in the RV hadn't seemed to have woken up yet. Should I tell them? I would want to know. 
but the rules say not to talk about it. I decided against it. Whatever this place was, I was getting pretty freaked out by it. But just one more night, I hurried up and packed up my day pack. I bundled Tango into the truck and we took off for a good 14 mile trail that would keep us busy all day. After a day of beautiful mountain meadows, surreal river views, gorgeous lakes, and 14 miles of walking, Tango and I returned to the campsite. I packed up everything that we would have need for the night into the truck. I noticed the RV in the next site, the couple with the three dogs, well, two dogs now I guess, were gone. No surprise there. However, the younger gentlemen on the other side of me were still there. Dinner was just a dehydrated hiking meal, since all the good food was packed up in the truck. I planned to get out of this place as quickly as I could in the morning. Sundown started coming and Tango and I got into the tent, locking it up behind us. I read a few chapters in my book until it was too dark to make out any of the words. Sleep came pretty easy tonight, but as is tradition, it didn't last very long. And twig snapping told me someone or something was stumbling around in the underbrush next to my tent. I checked my phone and it was around midnight. Not great, but at least I had slept through the house tonight. I could make out a couple of voices. The young guys from next door. Do you see anything? One of them had whispered. Nah, but it's definitely out there. The other said. My mind raised. These idiots were going to get themselves killed. I zipped open a small window on the side of my tent and I looked through the screen. They had flashlights out and were tramping around in the underbrush. They looked like they had their phones out in front of them, as if they were recording something, and then it stepped out of the woods into their light. Whether it was a man, a beast, or a strange combination of both, it was terrifying. I had never felt such utter, visceral fear. Seven or eight feet tall, burning red eyes and a body covered in patchy, greasy fur. Long claws and a protruding snout, fangs and slobber hanging off of it. They froze for a second, and then they ran, back to their tent, diving in. I reached over and grabbed my gun. I had to do something. But by the time that I was out of my tent, it had torn into theirs. Red and viscera flying as it tore into them. Furious. It was odd how silent the savagery was. I backed away, careful not to make any more noise. It got back in my tent and I locked it. What else could I have done? They were already gone. I pulled Tango close and kept a white knuckle grip on my Glock. I could hear it now, slurping and smacking, like it was an eight-year-old having spaghetti at an olive garden. Follow the rules. I did my best to sleep that night. When I finally rose, I realized it was daytime, midday almost. I opened my tent to find a cop car and blocking my truck in. A deputy sheriff was talking with another camper, pen and notebook in hand. When I glanced over at the next site, a group of people were loading a body bag into an ambulance. Scanning again, I noticed another deputy walking towards me, staring in grim look on his face. I flashed my badge and he seemed to relax a bit. Hey, you hear anything last night? Follow the rules. No, why? What happened? He gestured towards the body bags. A couple of campers got ate by a bear it looks like. You were 50 feet away and you didn't hear anything. No, hard day of hiking and all. We were pretty tired and we slept heavy. Sorry. No worries, he sighed. It gave him my name and contact info, and he let me go. I packed up the tent as quickly as I could, and I squeezed my truck past the cop car. On my way out, I stopped at the host site. I knocked, she answered. What the heck is this place? I blurted out. She smiled. Someplace ancient, not meant for our kind, but yet here we are. I hope you enjoyed your stay and then she shut the door in my face. 
I stared at the closed door. A tap from the window shocked me out of it. From the window of the camper, she mouthed the words, Follow the rules, to me. And so I did, and I left. Tango and I had a wonderful vacation, but the mountains have never felt the same to me since. The feeling of being watched, being followed, it's always there now. I moved not long after to Salt Lake City. I rarely go camping anymore, though Tango and I love our day hikes. I follow the rules, still to this day, every time that I go camping. Surely, that's what she meant. I got a job working as a cemetery night watchman. I barely survived one night. Written by Carl B. 1961. In the spring of 2003, I graduated high school and had a scholarship lined up at a nearby community college. I decided to get a summer job in order to make some extra money before I started my freshman year that fall. As it happened, a friend of my dad's worked as a caretaker at a local cemetery, but was taking a couple of months off in order to recuperate from some back surgery that he had scheduled soon. Duke, my dad's friend, told me his son Brian, who was about my age, had already volunteered to fill in as the temporary daytime caretaker. But if I was interested, he had another job I might be interested in. I asked him what it was and he told me. A night watchman. Apparently, there had been several other cemeteries in the area that had been vandalized recently. Probably the work of teenagers. And Duke needed someone to guard the cemetery between 8pm when it closed to the public for the day and 5am when his son Brian would show up for the job. Dude told me it wasn't an official county position, but he was willing to pay me out of his own pocket to do it. I was a little hesitant at first to accept the job. I'm not someone who scares very easily, but the thought of being alone in a deserted cemetery at night for nine hours, it did kind of give me the creeps. But I didn't really have anything else lined up for me that summer, and it sounded like it would be to flipping burgers at McDonald's anyway. So I shrugged and said, sure, why not? The cemetery where I would be working was on the outskirts of the town where I lived, out in the country, surrounded by a wide open farmland on three sides. The back of the cemetery ended at the edge of a small wooded area. It was pretty big and sprawling, maybe six acres, and was one of the oldest cemeteries in the area, with graves dating back to the early 1800s. I drove out there one bright, warm late afternoon in early June for my first shaft, and I was greeted by Duke, who was waiting for me near the entrance. He spent the next hour or so giving me a tour of the grounds and explaining what my job duties would consist of. Basically, I would give the whole cemetery a sweep every hour and write down any unusual activity, whatever that was, I encountered. And if I found anyone trespassing, I shouldn't confront them. I should just call the police instead. He took me into a small shed off to one side near the front. The place was crammed with tools and gardening equipment. There was a small desk with a chair and a notebook on it for me to log my reports. And a big flashlight. The long kind that takes 4D batteries to power. As soon as Duke finished showing me around... His face suddenly turned serious. He told me that he had something he wanted me to see, and took a ring of keys out of his pocket. I watched intrigued, as he unlocked a tall metal locker against one wall and opened it. I gasped. Inside stood a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun and a box of shells. Duke held the locker open for a few seconds to show me the shotgun, and then closed and relocked it. He explained to me that the shotgun was only for extreme emergencies, and that he didn't want me to touch it unless I felt sure that my life was in danger. He went on to say that you never know who might show up at a cemetery after dark. Usually it was harmless stuff, bored kids looking for a place to drink and screw around. 
but cemeteries also tended to be a hangout spot for all kinds of weirdos. You know the type. And sometimes even grave robberies. Seeing my look of concern, he gave me a reassuring smile and told me it wasn't likely I would run into any of those types of people on the job, but he wanted me to know about the shotgun just in case. And then he removed the locker key from the key ring and he handed it to me. By then, late afternoon had given away to early evening, and the sun had begun to set. Duke had pretty much shown me and told me everything that I needed to know, so we shook hands and then he left to go home. I watched as he got into his pickup truck and drove down the driveway and through the cemetery gate and out onto the road, disappearing from sight. I realized suddenly that I was all alone in a deserted cemetery, miles from anywhere, and it was starting to get dark. I shuddered in spite of myself. I looked at my watch and saw that it was nearly 8pm, the start of my first shift. I figured there was maybe an hour of daylight left. I did my first check of the cemetery grounds, beginning at the front, the newer section, and finishing in the back, the old section. This part of the cemetery was especially creepy. Many of the gravestones were cracked and leaning and eroded by the elements. Several of the plots had a sunken look. Duke had explained to me earlier when giving me the tour that this was caused by the soil settling on top of the old caskets as they deteriorated and collapsed underground. Again, I shuddered at the thought. The back of the cemetery ended at an embankment that sloped down to a shallow creek with the woods beginning on the other side. At the bottom of the embankment was a heap of old, rotting flower bouquets and wreaths from the graves. I figured Duke must dump them there after they began to dry out and fall apart. My whole inspection only took about 15 minutes, so I headed back to the maintenance shed to kill some time before the next one. I propped my feet up on the desk and pulled out a paperback Stephen King book that I had brought along to help pass the time. This was 2003, remember, long before smartphones came along. I read, absorbed in the harrowing ordeal of the Torrance family in the creepy Overlook Hotel, and before I knew it, 9 o'clock had rolled around. I put down my book, picked up my flashlight, and headed outside to patrol the grounds. It was almost fully dark now, and I could hear crickets. I strolled through the cemetery, starting again at the front and working my way to the back, casually aiming my flashlight around. I had just reached the rear of the cemetery when something happened. I stopped, listening, suddenly alert. I had heard something. I cocked my head, listening. I could hear a very faint, scraping sound, soft and slow and steady. I couldn't tell where it was coming from. I shined my flashlight around but could see nothing out of the ordinary. Just as abruptly as the sound had begun, it stopped. I shrugged it off, figuring it was probably some animal, a raccoon or a possum or something, scratching at the bark of a nearby tree. Finished with my inspection, I returned to the shed and picked up my bug. I spent the next half hour or so reading and was just at the part where the little boy Danny encounters the rotted old woman in the bathtub when I heard something outside that caused me to jump to my feet, knocking over my chair, startled. Footsteps. Slow labored, shuffling footsteps that sounded like they were moving around just outside the shack. My heart began to race. I stood there petrified with sudden fear. It was nighttime and the cemetery was closed. There shouldn't be anyone out there. I remembered what Duke had said about teenage trespassers. I waited, hardly daring to even breathe, my pulse racing, listening. The footsteps seemed to circle around the shack two or three times, and then gradually faded off into the distance. Silence resumed. I waited there for several minutes, too scared to investigate. I glanced at the locker with the shotgun inside of it, but remembered Duke telling me not to touch it unless I was in danger. 
It was probably just some local kids who came to have an underage to drinking party, or a couple teens looking for a place to make out. Except the cemetery was five miles out of town, and I hadn't heard any cars pull up outside. I stood there for the better part of five minutes, scared and indecisive. Finally, I told myself that I was being chicken crap and I needed to man up. Protecting the cemetery from trespassers was, after all, my job. It was probably some harmless old drunk or a drifter looking for a place to crash for the night. I summoned my courage, picked up the flashlight, and then opened the shed door and stopped outside. It was fully dark now, and totally pitch black. Thick dark clouds blotted out the moon and stars, and the only illumination came from my flashlight. Cautiously, I began a sweep of the cemetery. There was no sign of any intruder, and nothing looked out of place. But I could somehow still sense that something was wrong. Different. It took a couple minutes for me to place it. It was quiet. Too quiet. Dead quiet. The crickets had stopped chirping. An unnatural hush had fallen over the cemetery like a blanket. The only sound was my breathing. Besides that, it was as silent as well. Silent as a grave. I felt like I was being watched. I had read that cliched expression in a thousand bad horror stories and never believed it before then. But at that moment, alone in the dark in the middle of the night, in that unnaturally silent cemetery, I did. It seemed like I could sense a dozen sets of predatory eyes boring into me, observing my every move. So strong, it was almost a physical sensation. I was scared out of my mind. I stopped in my tracks abruptly, tensing, cocking my head. I had heard something. What was it? I listened. Faintly, I could hear that same soft, persistent scraping sound from before. I looked around, trying to pinpoint its location and source. It seemed to be coming from directly ahead of me and to my right. I cautiously moved on, tracking the sound, which seemed to get slightly louder the closer that I got. I was in the newer section of the cemetery, the part still in use. I stopped in front of a new grave where the sound seemed to be at its loudest. I trained my flashlight upon the marble headstone. It belonged to an elderly woman who had died only a couple weeks before. The mound of soil in front of the headstone was still brown and bare of grass from her recent burial. I listened, and realized the sound was coming from below the ground, below the grave. I felt a chill as cold as ice water rise from the pit of my stomach up to my heart. I tried convincing myself it was probably just a gopher or some other subterranean animal burrowing through the earth. And then something happened. I felt a tremor and heard the rumble of falling soil. Earthquake, I thought for a split second, but it only seemed to be coming from the fresh grave before me. Nowhere else. Then the rectangle of bare, mounded earth collapsed inward, almost in slow motion, looking like the roof of an elevator car descending its shaft. It happened in no more than five seconds. I stood there, transfixed in shock before a gaping black hole that only seconds before had been a full grave. It took a few moments for my brain to process what I had just witnessed. My mind was freaking out, screaming at me to run, but my body didn't listen. As scared as I was, some part of me was also curious. Some part of me had to see. Seemingly not of their own accord, my feet stepped to the edge of the sunken grave and I shined my flashlight down. The beam centered on a casket lying askew at the bottom of a pit. A pit that was at least 15 feet deep, much deeper than a grave, more like a mine shaft, with drifts of dirt all around it. And as I watched, the casket was moving, scooting along the bottom of the shaft inch by inch, scraping through the dirt. I moved the beam of my flashlight to the other end of the casket, 
and what I saw is something that still haunts my dreams to this day. There was a gaping black hole, the entrance of a tunnel on the side of the pit, and a pair of thin and gray arms with unnaturally long fingers, and long black claw-like fingernails were protruding from this hole, clutching the foot of the casket, dragging it into the tunnel a little at a time. And that's when I turned and ran back to the shed, panting in terror. I reached in my pocket for my phone to call the police, but it wasn't there. I must have left it out on the desk in the shed. I reached the shed, went through the door, and froze. The inside of the shed was in shambles. Everything had been trashed. Tools were scattered across the floor. The desk and chair had been turned over. My paperback had been torn to shreds. And my cell phone had been smashed to pieces. Someone had been in the shed while I had been outside. Or something. I stood there, taking in the destruction. And then I heard a sound coming from behind me. The same shuffling footsteps that I had heard before. I spun around. I seemed to regress in age in a matter of a few seconds. Reduced to the surreal, almost wondrous state of terror of a child in the grip of a nightmare. A figure stood in front of the doorway only a few feet outside the shed. It was cast in shadow, only a silhouette, but I could see it was tall and thin, with unnaturally long, skinny arms that hung down nearly to its feet. Its eyes were red. I could see them glinting in the dark like embers. They were staring right at me. We stood there for what felt like eternity, regarding each other, and then the shadowy figure took a step towards the door. I darted forward, slammed the door, and turned the lock. There was an unnaturally high-pitched, chittering screech from outside, a sound more animal-like than human. The creature began to pound wildly against the shed door. I jumped as something else slammed against the rear wall of the shed. I could hear claws scratching against the wood as if something was trying to burrow through the wall. Something else slammed into the side of the shed. There were more than one of them, and they were all trying to break into the shed at the same time. Trying to break in and get me. That was when I remembered the shotgun. Now I looked to the metal locker, still upright but now leaning to skew against one corner. I frantically searched the pockets of my jeans until I found the key that Duke had given me. With shaking hands, I unlocked the locker and I grabbed the shotgun, hoping that it was loaded. I had never touched a gun in my life and I had no idea how to load one, and there wasn't enough time anyway. I fumbled with it inexpertly for a few seconds, until I figured out how to get the safety off. The banging and screeching was coming from all around me. It sounded like the shed was surrounded on all four sides. I pumped the shotgun like I had seen it done in the movies, and then aimed it in my shaking hands at the door, clenched my teeth and pulled the trigger. The explosion was louder than I ever would have imagined, and the kickback was so powerful it almost knocked me backwards. The next morning, I would find an ugly bruise on my right shoulder where the stock of the shotgun had struck me. A ragged hole the size of a fist materialized in the door. For a split second after I fired the shotgun, I thought I detected a high-pitched streak of pain outside the shed door. And then I couldn't hear anything but a ringing in my ears. For a few seconds, I feared that I had gone deaf from the blast. And then slowly, my hearing returned. I knew because I could hear my own ragged breathing. Otherwise, there was silence. The screeching and banging had ceased. I listened intently, my heart pounding, but I heard nothing. And then cautiously, still clutching the shotgun, I crept to the battered shed door, unlocked it and threw it open, leveling the shotgun. There was nothing there but blackness. I fled the shed, running in an all-out sprint to my car, leaped in, locked the doors and started the engine and took off slamming down on the gas pedal. I sped down the driveway, my tires shrieking and sending gravel flying. I shot through the gate and then turned out onto the highway and back to town. But just before I drove through the gate, I saw, or thought I saw, one last thing in my rearview mirror. 
several pairs of glowing red eyes in the darkness behind my car. My phone had been destroyed, so I drove to the sheriff's office when I reached town and told them that I had been attacked by grave robbers. I was scared and badly shaken, but still possessed enough sense to know that they wouldn't believe me if I told them what I had really encountered in the cemetery. After I gave my statement, they called my parents who came and picked me up since I was still pretty rattled. My mom drove me home in the car while my dad followed behind us in mine. I went straight to my room after we got back and fell into bed, but it was several hours before I managed to fall asleep. The state police came by the next day to ask me some questions, and I told them the same story that I had told the sheriff and his deputy. I had been doing my hourly inspections of the grounds, and surprised a couple of grave robbers who had chased me back to the shed, and tried breaking in before I had scared them away with the shotgun that Duke had showed me. I hadn't gotten a good look at their faces, and couldn't even tell exactly how many there had been. The police didn't seem very satisfied with my answers and they looked suspicious. I think they could sense that I was holding something back, but they didn't press the matter and laughed soon after. A couple days later, Duke stopped by the house to see how I was doing. I told him that I was okay, but after my experience, I probably wouldn't be coming back to work. He seemed to understand and was apologetic about what had happened. He paid me 60 bucks in cash for my single disastrous shift as a cemetery watchman. I noticed that something else seemed to be bothering him. He had a troubled frown on his face and seemed disturbed, maybe even a little scared. I asked him how the police investigation at the cemetery was going. There had been a brief story about it on the local TV news, and if they had found any clues. But he just shrugged and said that so far, there wasn't much to go on. Somehow I could sense that he was lying. His answer seemed evasive, and I got the feeling he knew more than he was letting on. He left, and that was the last time I ever spoke to him. It took over a week for me to get over my ordeal, but then I was pretty much back to normal. I got a job working part-time at Blockbuster Video, back when that was a thing, for the rest of the summer and started college that fall. After I graduated in 2007, I got a job in the city, found a decent apartment, and married and had two kids. It's been 18 years since that night, and I had mostly put it behind me and forgotten about it, except for the occasional bad dream. And then last month, something happened. I had taken my family to the rural town where I grew up to visit my parents for the weekend. Just by chance, I ran into Brian, Duke's son, while in town getting some groceries. He recognized me from when we had been kids. We had never really been close friends, but had attended these same schools growing up, and belonged to some of these same social circles. And he invited me to a bar where we reminisced about old times, and caught up on each other's lives over a couple of beers. His father Duke had died peacefully in his sleep eight years before her, and now Brian worked in his dad's position as the cemetery groundskeeper. I asked Brian if the police ever got any leads on whoever it was who had dug up the grave and attacked me that night back in 2003. His mood instantly changed. His face darkened and he became guarded. He was silent for some time and seemed to be debating in his head what he should tell me. Finally, he leaned in close to me and made me promise that I would never tell anyone what he was about to tell me. I promised. Brian explained that the police had inspected the open grave and discovered the tunnel that I had seen at the bottom. They had investigated and discovered a whole network of underground tunnels running below the cemetery that looked to have been dug out by hand. Another tunnel entrance had been found partially concealed by undergrowth in the ditch at the bottom of the embankment in the rear of the cemetery. In the center of this subterranean tunnel system had been a large cavern that had been filled with splintered caskets, some dating back over a hundred years, and bones and body parts, some still relatively fresh. The human remains had all shown signs of having been devoured. I felt a chill pass through my body. 
Brian finished off his beer with a hard swig and set the bottle down with a trembling hand. He went on to explain that after this discovery, the police had notified the FBI, who had shown up to investigate, and after the FBI came, another government agency had gotten involved. I asked him who, but he just shook his head and told me that they hadn't said. Only that their jurisdiction had superseded both the state police and the FBI. They had taken over the investigation, shut down the cemetery, and had ordered everyone involved, including Duke, to stay silent with the threat of prosecution and imprisonment if they breathed a word of it to anyone. The cemetery had been closed for over a year while men in hazmat suits had collected the bodies in plastic bags and loaded them into unmarked black vans. And then one day, they were just gone. They left without a word, seemingly overnight, leaving no trace behind. The underground tunnels had been filled in with dirt, and after that, things had pretty much gone back to normal. Brian sat there quietly for a while. I thought he was finished, but then he added one final detail. The morning after my night in the cemetery, after the sheriff had looked around, but before the state police had arrived to do a more thorough investigation, Brian and his dad had found something outside the shed that the sheriff had overlooked. A small puddle of black liquid on the ground, outside the door that I had fired the shotgun through. Duke had figured it was probably just spilt motor oil from a bottle in the shed, and told Brian to clean it up. But Brian had noticed something his dad hadn't. A thin trail of the same black substance in the grass leading away from the shed, toward the embankment in the back of the cemetery. He had been curious and collected a small sample in a jar when his father wasn't looking, and he mailed it to an older cousin of his who worked as a technician in the anthropology department of a university across the state. A couple weeks later, Brian's cousin called him. They had analyzed the sample. They were able to determine it was blood, but the DNA sequence wasn't like anything they had ever seen before. They couldn't identify what the sample had come from, but whatever it was, it wasn't human. I'm a police investigator in Russia. Criminals aren't the only thing that keep me awake at night. Written by A.F.F. Everywhere you go in the world, there is crime being committed. It's the same here in Russia. Usually, there are street robberies. Sometimes, very rarely, homicides. Which is when the city government calls me in. A lot of the story I will tell you was certainly bring skepticism and doubt, but please believe me, I have little time left. I started off in the police force when I was 19. I rose up the ranks. In my 20s, I was confronted by one of my higher ops and was asked if I wanted to investigate some of the crime here, since apparently Many missing persons were found, done, in alleyways, and under bridges with one thing in common. A symbol carved onto the neck. The HR wanted me to investigate the attacks, in which I reluctantly accepted. I will forever regret there for the rest of my life. It was a couple of days before I was brought into the case but I was eventually in a room full of fellow investigators with an empty board. Okay, okay, everybody, silent. Those of you who have been brought in here by the Yakuza Police Department are going to be investigating several deaths that occurred. The lead investigator explained to us. As me and the rest of the team approached them, he pulled out a picture of one of the victims. As you can see, he said as he pointed at the neck on the photo, there appears to be a stick figure carved onto there. He then proceeded to pull out more photos from a box. See, 
Same thing. There is a connection here, as well as a very dangerous individual. We were all silent. We knew what we were going to be shown, but still, a lot of us were not prepared. He continued. We'll be heading to the most recent discovery of a victim. Get yourself ready. We're going. We all moved at a fast pace to gather our things and run outside to a car. We got in, and the lead investigator drove us there. I expected it to take a few weeks to crack the case, but it turns out that it would take days of my and many other men's lives, and it would take many lives. We arrived at the location and got out of the vehicle. Several policemen were guarding a checkpoint to stop anyone from wandering in. He led us to a body bag. Unzip it, officer, the lead said. Are you sure, sir? Yes, he responded. The officer unzipped it and walked to the checkpoint. Jesus, I exclaimed. What? The lead responded. One of the investigators approached the body. I think I see something under the shoulder. The investigator grabbed the decaying corpse and turned it around. There's a piece of paper, sir. He said as he turned to the lead. Let me see it. The lead said as he took it from him. In coordinates. It's north of here, four miles. Rookie, come here with your phone, he said as he pointed at me. I did as he said. Put these coordinates in. I followed his instructions. It's an abandoned apartment, sir, I said. Well then, that's where we're headed, he said as he zipped up the bag. We all rushed back to our car, and he drove us there. It was only about a three-minute drive. We all had some small talk on the way, regarding the case. We're here. Everyone out. Fast, fast, the lead said. We all ran out. Makarov's lowered, at a fast pace. Go, 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 Dave. He was screaming. The lead kicked down the entrance and ran in. Clear. We all followed him quickly. We did the same to every room of the building until we had reached the basement door. Get ready. There could be some spooky stuff in here. He said as he walked down the stairs leading to the door. He lowered his pistol, and we did the same. Open the door for me, he said to me as I was at the front of the line. I approached, and I felt as if something was seriously wrong. But I opened the door and the lead walked in, me trailing right behind him. There was a lamp pointing toward the wall. It was off. We approached it in the pitch black and scrambled to see if there was any on switch. Eventually, it turned on. I turned to the wall and my skin went pale. The lead turned right after me and gasped. There was a tall, pale entity facing toward the wall. Hello? I asked. The lead told everyone to walk in. We all walked over to it. Hello, do you need help? I repeated. It turned around and stared at us. It oddly reminded me of the stick man on all the victims. It screeched and ran at the lead. He discharged around at its chest, but it kept going. Ed tackled him down and started ripping at his flesh. Holy crap, someone screamed. 
We all ran for the stairs. Most of us reached the door out of the basement. I saw many people try to run to the door, but it was too late. It was too close to them. They wouldn't make it in time. I just stood there until a fellow investigator shut the door close and locked it. I could hear screams and bangs at the door. Poor guys. I could hear them being ripped to shreds. I could hear gunshots in there too. Come on, that'll only hold him off for so long. Someone screamed. I finally got to my bearings and ran with everyone else. When we got to the car and hightailed it back to the station. We went in as ten men, came out as six. The highest ranking officer in the station approached us as we came in. What the heck happened? Where is your lead? He's dead, sir. I responded. What happened? He said, right before taking us to the investigation room. We gave our pistols to the HR as he was collecting them and putting them away. You, he pointed at an investigator. Explain what in the world happened out there. Well, we encountered a, the attacker, and we left and he could barely finish. We left them for dead. It got them all, he finished. You didn't even try firing at it, the HR asked. We did. It didn't do anything to it, I said. You seem like the right guy for leading this. At least you ain't stuttering like the rest, he said as he turned to me. 1am tonight. Park outside the apartment. You will be listening in on the communications of our local raid team, he said. You mean they're going in, I asked. Yes. What else would you be listening to? He responded. They're not going to make it. It's you. He cut me off with. It's an order. At 1 a.m. in the morning, I was parked outside the apartment, listening in on the radio with a headset. We're going in. Do you read? They asked. Read. You can go in. I said in a hopeless voice. I knew that I was going to listen in on their final moments. I heard them walk into the building. I heard them reach the stairs. And I heard them kick down the door. Status? I asked. Positive. Zero problem. They responded. Hello? I exclaimed in fear. Stop right there. Police. This is the police. I heard. And after that, I heard shotgun blasts and running. Status update. You boys alright? My radio was cut off. The plan was, I'd take the raid team out of there with my car if crap hit the fan. If you don't understand, I had to go in there. I took off my headset and got out of my car. I had a pistol just in case I needed it. As I walked into the apartment, I could smell something vile. I knew these men were already gone. The door to the basement was wide open. I walked in, aiming. I thought maybe if I didn't disturb it, it wouldn't notice me. I heard a whisper in the shadows. The room was pitch black. I just kept walking, until someone grabbed my arm and pulled me back. It was one of the policemen. Shh, stay quiet, he said. Are you the only one left? I whispered. Yeah. He was snatched by something and pulled away. No, no, he was screaming. I ran around, trying to find the lab. I felt around and I grabbed it. I turned it on and I aimed at the creature's face. 
as it tore off the office's rest. The creature was blinded and it dropped him, but it was too late for the officer. I dropped the lamp at the stairs and smashed the door behind me. I kept the lamp on, so if it broke through the door, maybe it would be blinded again and retreat back. I drove home and got to my bed, and I got some much needed rest. It would be better to report what happened later. I woke up, had some breakfast, and drove to the station as soon as I could. The HR was waiting for me as I walked in. What happened last night? He asked. They're all gone. Like I told you, we need to stop the- I know, he said. I got permission from the city government to use C4, he told me. Finally. It's only been a couple days, I was saying. Right, he cut me off. I'm sending more officers to go in there with you. Without hesitation, I got into my car and drove behind several police cars. We arrived at the apartment. I got out of the car and watched as an armored policeman carried a box of explosives into the building. Several other policemen had their guns aiming on the entrance. I noticed that a truck carrying concrete was moving toward the entrance. The policemen were radioed something and they holstered their pistols. I got out of my truck and asked the HR what that truck was doing here. It's closing off the entrance, he said. I turned off my radio. Just a second after, it dropped all the concrete down onto the entrance. And then suddenly, the explosives went off. I quickly realized the policeman was still inside there. Wait! I was screaming, but the HR walked up to me. It's okay. I walked over to some of the other policemen. I realized they were the other investigators that I was working with. Hey, I said. Is it... is it finally done? One of the investigators asked. Yes, I responded. I heard a shout and then a scream, as I turned to where the door used to be. There was a pale arm sticking through, and then a foot pushed out of the rubble. After this is posted well, there's nothing I can do this time. They're trying to toss more concrete onto it. That won't work. May only God help the poor civilians in the houses nearby. I realize my fate and I close my eyes. People have been disappearing from my town. Some have returned fused together. Written by Weird Bryce Guy. Three people disappeared yesterday. Each person was from a different family. They all disappeared at the same time, without any obvious signs of violence. Emily, a girl the age of 19, disappeared from her house wherein she lived alone. Dr. Acreage, 34, vanished while working in his garden. Alicia, 20, was last seen departing her boyfriend's home, following a morning of food and prayer with his neighbors. The time in which the people disappeared was around 2 p.m. Searches were conducted, both within and without the town, but to no avail. We found no clues nor any indication of foul play from outsiders. This place is fairly isolated, geographically at least. One must drive through several miles of a heavily forested area, which unfortunately I am not at the liberty to share before you can reach the outer territory of our intentionally secluded community. My ancestors built this town amidst the trees and underbrush of an ancient and beautiful forest, with the hope of developing a close-knit and culturally prosperous community, devoid of the hazards of a traditional society. 
We live off and even financially thrive from the harvests of the land. Enjoy mutually agreeable trade with the relatively far-flung towns and cities without issue. We are not necessarily a commune or any other considerably buclalic settlement. Only a group of people, Americans to specify just a bit, living happily together and connected to, but not largely involved with Western civilization. But since the disappearances and subsequent reappearances, I am forced to seek help from beyond our town, or at the very least, insight. Because the three people did not stay gone for long. They reappeared, again at the same time, but also in the same place. They appeared as one entity, fused together horribly, monstrously, conscious and in an unrelatable agony. While sitting in the dining hall, reading a folkloric story to a few children assigned to my recreational care, there was a sudden commotion. Woman's screams rang out in the spacious hall. The disturbance seemed to be centered around the foremost dining table, reserved for the town's governance during communal fees, and of sufficient enough disagreeableness to cause a great uproar. People entered the dining hall, and upon seeing the source of the commotion, promptly fled, screaming all the while. I ushered the children out the hall's main entrance and returned to investigate. In my brief absence, a crowd had formed, consistently mostly of men. There were only two women there. One, the mother of Emily, weeping insensibly on her knees. The other, Mrs. Acreage, the doctor's wife. She stood frozen, staring dumbly upon the object of the crowd's shock and, for some, terror. Curious and not one to be easily startled, I elbowed through the crowd's perimeter until I came at last upon the thing. I've read many books, largely in preparation for my hopeful vocation, chief librarian and archivist of the town, but I could not find the words, the appropriateness of language, to fully express the sheer awfulness of that abomination, that warped, revolting chimera of human morphology. Fused together upon the chief dining table were those three who had, the day before, disappeared. They, it, were nude. Their clothing had been at some point in their low submerging, taken or destroyed. When I say fused, I do not mean that their bodies were surgically grafted or stitched together. Had that been the case, the reaction of the crowd might have been less based in horror. Fear, undoubtedly, but perhaps anger as well. The desire for vengeance would have arisen only moments after the thing's discovery. But those poor souls were not artificially attached to one another. They had been, through some unreal, blasphemous force, reconstituted as a single, abominable being. The mass, as some have come to call it, was entirely naked, glistened as if newborn, and built so that the limbs jutted outward, while the central trunk served as the sole body of all three people. The heads, a conscious but thankfully mute, lined its back, a perverse a spinal column of syphilic projections. Dr. Acreage's head was the lowermost, Emily served as the middle bud, and Alicia's was the topmost. To get a better sense of the thing's twisted anatomy, imagine it on its belly, with the legs and arms at twelve in total, placed with a terrible asymmetry along the sides of the trunk, and the heads extending from the back. There was no distinction between chest, abdomen, and waist, no segmentation of the shared body, only a single trunk, from which the limbs sporadically flailed. This hopefully paints an imaginable, though hardly complete, picture for you. I am not an autonomist. I would never in a thousand years devote my life to the study and expression of such a depravity. The mass writhed upon the table in untold agony. The heads mouthed their pain. The eyes blinked at us in what were assuredly attempts to relate some fraction of their torment. But no sounds escaped their lips and their limbs seemed to only operate on some uncontrollable or dimly instinctual level. Hands opened and closed, legs kicked and spasmed, 
The trunk, the shared body of three persons, heaved and shuddered, its intake of air both great and violent. I only realized that I had started to cry when my sight became blurry. I initially thought that it was in some strangely protracted process of fainting, that the sight was so horrible as to induce a state of unconscious shock. But after a few more moments, I was still not spared the hideousness of the mass. I wiped my tears away, took another soul-shrinking glance at the mass, and stumbled from out of the crowd. Others, having had their fill of the terrible sight, followed suit. Eventually, only the loved ones of those affected remained at the mass's side. I found a seat at a table beyond the sight of the quivering, soundlessly moaning thing, and I wept into my arms. Eventually, people were equipped to deal with tragedy, but nothing so tragic as this, entered the dining hall and had a small, outwardly stoic group erected a makeshift curtain around the mass. Behind the curtain, they convened, while the rest of us stood inside of the dining hall, or outside of it, as was the case with the children and faint of heart. I had remained seated throughout the erection of the curtain wall, and only moved farther away at the request of our town's equivalent of a mayor, who asked for privacy while he and the other leaders tended to the afflicted trio. I complied without a word. Since Dr. Acreage was one of the unresponsive fused, his knowledge was unfortunately barred from us. We had only our equivalent of a veterinarian to rely upon for the biological assessment, and she was, unsurprisingly, ill-equipped to handle such a situation. No one had ever seen such a thing before, had never heard of anything so horrible happening in our community. Those of us who've ventured outside our town, they number in the tens among the nearly a thousand, likewise expressed their unfamiliarity with such wickedness. Eventually, as these shaded men spoke among themselves, the crowd started to murmur, and rumors and tales of witchcraft, devilry, and other black-souled or soulless business started up. Some called the mass an omen of dark times to come, that its monstrous form augured the advent of an annihilating pestilence or pandemic. Others conversely believed it to be some sort of god coming into human form, that the mass was not yet complete, but a fledgling thing awaiting further development, following sufficient amounts of praise and offering. Where these beliefs and wild speculations came from, I cannot say, for our town has no core religion. We are not bound by any spiritual belief or theological study. We are not expressly atheist either. People are free to practice a faith of their choosing, or not to practice at all. But I suppose that when confronted with something so obscene, so unprecedented and unreal, people naturally turn their thoughts to the supernatural. Having seen the thing in all its bare dreadfulness, I cannot blame them. How could such an odious thing be of this world? Despite the bizarre and horrific nature of the mass, there was no immediate talk of seeking help from the communities beyond our territory. After several minutes of what I'm sure was fruitless observation and speculation, the town leaders announced that the returned, a more human term than the mass, would be looked after. They ordered people to return to their homes, declaring, for the first time in my lifetime, a state of self-enforced isolation. We were to at once seclude ourselves in our homes and remain there until further notice. Food and resources would be brought door to door as needed. Shocked yet habitually disciplined, we did as we were ordered and returned to our homes. I live with my brother. He is 26, five years my senior. He did not see the mass and in those first few hours following its appearance, I could not bring myself to describe it to him. Only as night descended and the unreality of the situation lessened to a more fathomable degree, did I spare a few words of the mass's design. My brother, of course, did not believe me, refused to believe that something so heinous could exist. But I countered his incredulity with the facts of the situation, 
why else would the town leaders declare a state of self-isolation, something they hadn't done in nearly 30 years? I let him sit with this in the living room and went into my room to clear my head. Due to my professional aspirations, I am allowed certain privileges. The most notable of these is my access to the internet. We do not exist in some pre-industrial state, but we also endeavor to rely as little as possible on the technological conveniences of the modern world. As such, cell phones, laptops, and electronic entertainment equipment are simply not brought into the town. We are aware of such items and we do not fear or explicitly distrust them, but neither do we utilize them in our daily lives. However, once a week, I am allowed access to a small personal computer with which I order volumes of literature to be placed in our town's library. People may submit requests for specific pieces or even topics, and I am allowed to procure them if there is money available in the budget after the more educational literature is secured. The ordered items are delivered to the mailing station beyond town, and someone approved for outside travel retrieves them. For the sake of convenience, this computer is, for the single day I have access to it, installed within my home. It is on this computer that I am, for the first time in my life, writing to this outside world. I write to you not because of the initial strangeness. The trio alone would not compel me to violate these simple but straight terms of my much appreciated privilege. I write to you because, only an hour ago, Another group disappeared. The news was widely brought to us by a neighbor who, in a state of mania, reported that his wife had disappeared while brewing tea. The sound of the kettle crashing to the floor alerted him to the unceremonious vanishing. Before even my brother or I could question him further, the man went screaming into the night, and eventually, two other townspeople joined him, both with sightings of their own. Not long after, the town-wide discipline I had before applauded was forsaken, as people gathered together in a panicked congregation. Before anyone could speak about the frightened murmuring, one of the town's leaders stumbled out of the dining hall, where he and the others had remained in guard and study of the mass. He regarded the crowd brusquely, almost absentmindedly calling for order only once before allowing the concert of voices to drown him out. Almost a full minute passed before the crowd had quieted down, having realized with a profound simultaneity what the man's somber demeanor suggested. Someone cried out, Oh no, oh god no, in a voice full of such powerful sorrow. Others covered their mouths with their hands. My brother grabbed my hand, a gesture he hadn't done since we were children. A gust of wind, its suddenness almost providential, blew open the dining hall doors. Beyond the rows of tables, still uncleared from the day's earlier meal, rested the still writhing mass atop the foremost table. The once obscuring curtains had, perhaps during the leader's hasty exit, been knocked over. In that morbidly revelatory moment, the entire population of the town stood outside the dining hall. Perhaps half of that had a clear view inside, and of this subgroup, only two or three lacked the keenness of sight to see the mass in all its awful fullness. My eyesight is excellent, as is my brother's. We saw the mass. We saw its new form. There were more legs and more heads. The body had lengthened. Three more people had been grotesquely incorporated into the mass. The three who had vanished from their homes only minutes prior to the congregation's formation. We all returned to our homes, this time without instruction. Terror fell like an umbrage over the entire town. No one bothered to consult with the leaders. It was obvious that there was nothing they could do. It is obvious that there is nothing we're capable of doing ourselves. I am in my room on the computer, sharing my story with the outer world. We are in a nightmare here. We are cursed, or have been beset by a plague of an unknown and terrestrially unprecedented nature. Worst of all, the mass has now been given voice. 
the six heads now scream their collective agony into the night. Their cries are bestial, bereft of humanity. There is nothing but an abysmal and blind madness in their tones. No one dares to try and silence them. No one dares to do anything at all. The dining hall which sits in the center of our town remains open. Its sole occupant on display for all to see. Our houses encircle the town center. I can see other faces peering through their windows. I see only the deepest terror in their eyes. Please help us. What do we do? What is happening to my town? I fell asleep not long after submitting the last entry. Perhaps half an hour more of consciousness before the shock and terror of the day caused my mind to collapse inward. I awoke several hours later, slumped against my desk, my face resting uncomfortably upon the keys. Outside, dawn crept along, and still, the din of that monstrous chorus rang out. It renewed my terror, which had briefly been subdued by the exhaustion of the previous day. I fumbled out of my room, meaning to brew some tea and see if a new day's mind could find some heretofore unconsidered recourse. But as I prepared my drink, I noticed something different about the chorus. Something new. The mists of the morning settled thickly upon the town's largely flat terrain, occluded the dining hall from sight. Only the sounds of the masses' communal torment escaped the building. And still, I wouldn't have needed to peer into the dining hall's depth to confirm my suddenly emergent suspicions. I ran through our small house, going from room to room, but found them all empty. My brother had disappeared in the night, had, I realized, and accepted with an inexpressible sorrow, joined the mass. The well-maintained lawns before the perimeter lining houses were empty, as were the paved paths and garden plots of the town. Everyone had remained in their homes throughout the night, and no one had dared to venture out. And yet I knew, all too well, that this precaution was largely, if not entirely, pointless. People could be taken regardless of whether or not they were inside of their homes. It was this unfortunate certainty that drove me to leave the house, to venture out into that morning, to silence the abominable choir permanently. Grief impelled me. Fury guided me on when the former emotion threatened to send me to my knees in a state of despair. The warmth of the newly risen sun did little to assuage the chill that had spread throughout my body. A chill born of loss. Loss to come. But before I reached the dining hall, several townspeople swiftly left their homes. I at first thought that they were joining me in my assaults upon the creature, driven to the same dark conclusion by their own losses. But one, an older man with whom I had spent a few days discussing a mutually enjoyed author, strode directly toward me, and before I could think to defend myself, he seized me by the shoulders and threw me to the ground. I landed roughly, banging my elbow on a stone. Pain shot up through my body, counteracting the disorientation, suffered at nearly the same time by the sudden impact of another person's boot against my skull. My head swam, but I did not lose consciousness. Rolling onto my back, I looked up to identify my attackers and hopefully defend myself from more harm. Two mean-faced men stood over me, and before I could question their violence, I was lifted up, and something was snatched from my hand. A hammer. I didn't remember grabbing it, but recognized my brother's tool. I had apparently snatched it up prior to departing the house. I was made to kneel before the dining hall. Inside, I saw the all-too-familiar form, a thing snatched from some biologist's nightmare. The mass's anatomy was chaos. Limbs curled, kicked, and quivered. Heads rocked back and forth as they belted out the excruciating state of their monstrously merged existence. The trunk, horribly long and thick, heaved with even greater violence than before, 
as it's assuredly weak lungs, a struggle to pump enough air for the many ceaseless voices. Resting near the middle of the trunk, flanked by Alicia and an elderly woman, was my brother. My brother's head, dumbly howling in pain. Its eyes stared at the ceiling, heedless of his kneeling sister beyond the dining hall's doors. Before I could appeal to my apparently crazed assailants, a woman, the very woman whose position as librarian I was to inherit, stepped in front of me, wearing nothing beyond a scowl. Her nude, wrinkly body glistened in the sunlight, suggesting a considerable amount of sweat, most likely produced by anxiety. Yet despite my assumption, her eyes that glared at me, not in fear but with rage, the man who had cobbled me jerked me up so that I was made to look at the woman who stood before me haughtily, hands on her hips, in an unashamedly vainglorious posture. You would threaten the returned. They who have through a beatific merging ascended to godhood. It is through this merging that we may finally know what it means to be divine, to be free of the hazards as our ancestors so eloquently put it of the modern, mundane world. Don't you see, child? They are the way by which we cast off our worries, our burdens, all of our troubles. Fear arose again in my heart. Only now its origin was this woman's insane pronouncement. Somehow, in the span of mere hours, Mrs. Galloway, widow and self-admitted agnostic, had latched onto the insane idea of this horrific mass being some sort of godly being. I stared at her with no small amounts of indignance, as she gestured brawly to a crowd I heard convening behind me, but could not see. As these sounds of their footsteps neared, I saw in my peripheral vision several others also naked. Some came and knelt beside me, of their own free will while others walked slowly toward the dining hall, arms raised in a deep reverence of the still wailing monstrosity therein. As the sun crawled across the sky and further illuminated the town center, more people left their homes, most coming to join the nude congregation. Some remained on their lawns or stood throughout the various interconnected walkways, incredulous and unhelpfully passive stragglers. No one openly challenged Mrs. Galloway's deranged sermon. Then, as if to further emphasize the immensity of her madness, Mrs. Galloway turned away from the congregation, strode up proudly into the dining hall, and embraced the mass. The hands and feet slapped and kicked at her dumbly, innocuously, but Miss Galloway not only endured the unfocused blows, but seemed to welcome them as if they were the hugs and kisses of grandchildren. She groped the faces of these shrieking heads and kissed each in turn, and found myself jerking forward in protest when her lips found the creased forehead of my brother. But my jailers kept me restrained, and I received a debilitating boot to the ribs for my perfectly justified response. Doubled over in pain, I could only watch helplessly as Miss Galloway caressed and even fondled the mass, a display of physical adoration that almost went over the line. There was no intelligence in the many eyes of the mass, no comprehension of anything but their communal agony. Soon, others joined her. Bodies watched or even ran into the dining hall to grope the clueless heads and autonomously flailing limbs. Eventually, the two men who had seized me went off to join the gathering, and I was left largely alone in the yard outside the building. Before I could stand, my side still ate horribly from the blow. More hands seized me, but these only assisted me to my feet. I turned to find two familiar faces, Alicia's boyfriend being one, and one of the town's leaders being the other the same leader who had stumbled out of the dining hall the night before. And quickly, they led me from the yard, while others went and shut the hall's door. I was taken back to the leader's home, no more grand or stately than anyone else's, and there my injury was treated with an ice pack and pain medication. Alicia's boyfriend, 
A man in his twenties named Mitchell offered me water and I accepted. While I drank, the leader told me about how he and the others had, during their conversations the night before, decided to contact the outside, but all attempts to do so had failed. The few phones in the village had overnight simply ceased to work, and the two men who had attempted to venture outside inexplicably vanished before leaving the town's territory. This last revelation was the most shocking. These suggestions that attempts to leave would only result in one's sudden disappearance and, presumably, subsequent incorporation into the mass. I told them about how I had attempted to send a message to the outside via the computer, and the leader applauded my efforts and implored me to try again. Sufficiently recuperated, I went outside through the back door of his home, so as to avoid notice by any of Mrs. Galloway's violent accolades. I snuck through yard after yard, traveling in the arcing path which led back to my own home, and eventually crept in through a back window. The window in question was my brother's, and I briefly faltered as I looked upon his belongings and thought of him writhing in irremediable agony. Unnaturally, or in a certain morbid light, naturally attached to that abhorrent bulk. But before I could log the morning's frightful events, and more explicitly ask for the assistance of the outside world, a sudden and violent shock shook the house, shook the world, and I was thrown to the floor. Dazed but unharmed, I arose and scampered to the front of the house. Peering through the front windows, I saw the dining hall in flames. The doors had burst open, and several people, running and burning, ran out into the yard, where they eventually fell in writhing, flaming heaps. Others succumbed to their fiery ends with an unsettling stoicism, walking, not running, out of the dining hall and falling to their knees with hands across their bodies and heads angled down. I counted at least 50 people in the first few moments following the eruption. All aflame. Black smoke quickly filled the sky. Due to the distance in the walls of my house, I was spared the stench of what was cooking. As they burned, the dining hall began to collapse inward, the flames undoing the immaculate construction of my ancestors. The sight was almost as horrible as the monster housed within, and I shed new tears at the latest incident, and what was quickly starting to seem like a never-ending nightmare. And still, above the roar of the flames and the screams of the burning, I heard the resilient clamor of the agonized mass. Whether or not its screams were in response to the ravaging flames or its usual torment, I could not tell. Eventually, buckets of water were brought by those who had not been indoctrinated, and most of the bodies were extinguished. Efforts were made to salvage the hall, but by the time the conflagration was put out, most of it had fallen to ruin, leaving only a blasted husk of the building. But within, seemingly unscathed by the disastrous blaze, was the mass. And despite having not actually counted since the previous night, I knew that in the brief period of time between my short-lived capture and escape, the mass had grown in number. From such a distance, I could not tell who the newly incorporated were. It was impossible to verify if the appalling thing had produced new members, or if the usual but still bizarre method of disappearance begotten incorporation was the only way to facilitate merging. Those who had quelled the blaze wandered around, first in assessment of the burned, none had survived, and then seemingly in shock. I was similarly affected by the sight and sat slumped against the window for some time, watching as the smoke curled into the sky and the blackened bodies quietly, lifelessly smoldered. Despite having awakened only an hour or so before, I felt tired, exhausted even. I left the window and I went to my room. And this is all that I have to say for now. I am asking in earnest for help. We cannot leave. The mass or the force that made it won't let us. Even worse, the mass now has a cult. Deranged devotees who believe it to be a divine being. It is now doubly unsafe for those of us left. If we are not taken, we will be dealt violence or even death by the deranged followers of the returned. 
I do not know how many of them are left, but anyone it seems can be turned toward the cause can be made to be a believer. An inability to rationally cope with these circumstances could truly drive someone insane, make them see logic in the absurd. I don't yet know the cause of the explosion, but I can't imagine the devotees being behind it. It was obvious by Miss Galloway's words that they seek conscious, physical transcendence, not some spiritual ascension achieved through violent self-sacrifice. But it's also hard to believe that someone like myself, someone uninterested in Miss Galloway's haphazardly formed religion, would burn down the dining hall with so many people inside. I'm going to get some rest. I think I've earned that much, given what's happened. I would appreciate any suggestions for helping my people. But now, more than ever, I think secrecy regarding my town's location is more important than ever. Now that I know, no one can leave once they've entered it. I did not wake from sleep naturally, nor peacefully. I was violently shaken awake by Mr. Gibson, the town leader who had helped me, following me being taken by Mrs. Galloway, before she and a group of her devotees entered the dining hall and threw their bodies onto the mass. Mr. Gibson's eyes were alight with panic, and this expression of extreme distress served to help clear my mind of the cobwebs of sleep. He backed away for a moment, and allowed me to blink away what lingered of my drowsiness, then sat on the edge of my bed and explained the present situation to me. The waiting, that's what they've called themselves, are going into houses and pulling people out of them, and they're, they're stripping them and marching them to that thing. They built some kind of stage around it out of the dining hall's remains. They're forcing people to place their hands on it. They're hurting people like cattle, forcing them to pay obedience to the... The mass, I told him, why I'd come to call the amalgam of fused bodies. He nodded, darkly accepting the term. Anyone who refuses to pledge some sort of spiritual fealty to the mass is struck down, beaten in the dirt and tossed aside. And to make matters worse, people are still disappearing and reappearing attached to the mass. No one seems to be safe, believe her or not. Only now, the believers see it as an honor, as some sort of transcendence. But they all end up screaming and unresponsive regardless. Mr. Gibson's face was coated in sweat, as was his navy blue collared shirt. His tan slacks bore splotches of dirt, and what I hoped wasn't red. He looked beyond tired, existentially exhausted. I rose from the bed, asked for a moment of privacy, to which he complied, and redressed myself. I set aside the blouse that I'd been wearing for the last few days, and pulled on a more comfortable t-shirt and sweatpants. Once dressed, I joined Mr. Gibson in my living room where I found him sitting at my brother's favorite recliner, staring out into the murk of the night through the front windows. I realized then, despite having a window in my room, that I had slept through the entire day, and a lot had happened in the interim. Outside, the sky was dark, and the usually star-dotted expanse was now beclouded by the still-lingering smoke of the day's earlier fires. And my heart sank as I spotted the piles of scorched bodies resting at seemingly random spots throughout the town center. Black knolls were in the corpses of friends and familiar faces. No one was truly a stranger, rested with no regard for funeral reverence. Many houses in the town's ring-like perimeter were in these states of ruin. The glass of smashed windows littered lawns. Splintered doors hung off hinges or rested within the interior of the houses, fractured or dented beyond repair. Only a few houses had been spared at the violence of forced entry, and I assumed that the owners had, for reasons of ease or conversion, willingly come along with the would-be intruders. My house had not been raided, for which I was immensely thankful, considering I had been utterly exhausted and unconscious the easiest target any intruder could have asked for. Your brother is among the mass, and I believe they assumed you have died in the fire. 
That is probably why your home was spared. I turned to him and saw the sadness in his eyes. He and my brother had gotten along well. My brother aspired to serve in a similar leadership role, albeit in a more practical, architecturally involved position. Mr. Gibson, being a skilled carpenter, had imparted what knowledge he could to my keenly receptive brother, who received it gratefully, hungrily, eager to learn and apply his newly acquired skills where he could. He had built our dining table and chairs, truly impeccable craftsmanship, considering his relative inexperience. Our parents hadn't left us much in their will, and my brother had been determined to build whatever we couldn't reasonably afford. I looked out the window toward Mr. Gibson's home, northwest from my own, and saw it still intact. He followed my gaze and smiled, but in his smile I saw an even deeper sadness. They spared my house because I told them that I would join them, if they allowed me to recruit people through less dramatic means. I tensed up at his explanation for his house as safeguarding. My immediate thoughts went to the worst possibility, that he was here to try and convince me to join Mrs. Galloway's insane cult, but he read my expression and shook his head. I am here for two reasons, and neither of them are that. First, I want to know what you've learned from the outside world, assuming you've managed to make contact. We cannot physically leave and neither can we make contact via phone, but I hope the internet would yield more fruitful results. Secondly, I wanted to ask your opinion on something. Relaxing somewhat, I nodded my willingness to hear him out and settled into a chair at the nearby dining table. From this position, I had a clear view out into the town center, but could also keep my attention on Mr. Gibson. I confirmed that I had managed to send a message, a mostly complete account of the events thus far, even in that nearly all the responses urged me to contact the outside authorities. But beyond that singular piece of advice, there hadn't been much worth mentioning. Mr. Gibson nodded, but his expression was easily readable. He was disappointed. So, this dilemma, it's not something anyone else has ever encountered before, is it? I shook my head. I had hoped for a precedent, some recognizable case of a populace of facing horror, or even a less sinister phenomenon, but neither found nor was shown anything immediately relevant, or even vaguely similar to our situation. Mr. Gibson sighed and then stood and stretched himself. He walked toward the window, standing so close, his nose rested against the glass. His eyes seemed fixed on the massive altar across the town, on which sat the mass. Thankfully, the darkness denied me sight of its abominable features. The only confirmation of its presence was the hellish chorus of screams. I saw people dark, nearly inscrutable outlines standing around or kneeling before the stage. All, as far as I could tell, were naked. The various lights that ordinarily blazed throughout the town at night were off, their electric illumination replaced by the almost sinister glow of torches, each throwing eerie shadows upon the grounds. They were placed at intervals, in a smaller circle within the greater ring of the town's perimeter most implanted in these small plots of lawn between the houses. None were close to the congregation or the horror that they worshipped, and yet the shadowed gathering carried out their silent, from this distance, praise as if guided by some deeper sight. The other buildings, the school, library, and places of business were all dark, their interiors unlit and fronts undamaged. The crazed mob had apparently forsaken these places, preferring only the raised and subsequently repurposed dining hall for their insane and naked occupation. There's only a handful of us left now. There weren't that many to begin with compared to out there. He gestured vaguely, although I understood he meant the world beyond our town. I grew up here, only knew its small but well-maintained grounds, its once kind and peaceful inhabitants. I've always been aware of the world's size and its happenings, and yet my town has always been big enough for me, pleasantly active and sufficiently populated without being overwhelming. Stay here, 
Once I've gathered those willing to leave their homes, we'll join the awaiting. We'll play along as smoothly and safely as we can. They have no reason to come here, so you should remain safe, as long as you don't draw attention to the house itself. As of right now, you're this town's only hope. I don't know how long the power will remain functioning, so you should probably do what you can with the computer before the electricity and internet cut out. He turned to me, and the fear that had been in his eyes was now replaced by a sudden and severe conviction. Regardless of how things play out for us, we cannot allow that thing to grow beyond the population of this town. It is not some angelic being or a path to godhood. It is an abomination. If there is anything divine about its existence, it's that it was meant as a godsend punishment. He went to my front door, but before we could leave, I called out. Who started the fire? Who tried to destroy it? But I held my tongue before I could say, Who killed all those people? Mr. Gibson only hesitated a second before answering. It cannot be allowed to take anyone from outside this town. This, for whatever reason, is our curse. He then went out into the night, leaving me alone to figure out how to save my home. This, unfortunately, is essentially all that I have to report up to this point. Heeding Mr. Gibson's words, I would like to get out as much information of the ongoing dilemma as I can, before the power shuts off and I am literally left in the dark, cut off from not just the world, but the convenience of artificial light as well. I plan to remain in my house and observe what I can of the night-shaded proceedings. The nude figures theatrically gesticulate and even dance, seemingly random, but nonetheless eerie. Motions of physical worship toward the agonized, idiot god before them. Any sounds they might be making are drowned out by the masses at tireless, abysmal wailing. But the wind, blowing heavily now, has finally forced the stench of those burnt into my house. I can smell and even taste the ash and death. How I've yet to be taken remains a mystery. There seems to be no logic or discernible mechanism of operation to the phenomenon at all, aside from the aforementioned method of forcing it, attempting to leave the territory of the town. I have no desire to be added to that monstrous fusion, no inclination towards religious absurdity. No matter how bleak or nightmarish things become, I will not submit to any dark influences or crazed proselytizing. I have been tasked with a duty, entrusted ironically with the town's actual salvation. Silence suddenly descended upon the town. For the first time since its abhorrent creation, the mass has ceased bellowing its choral agony. I can now hear the strange, inarticulate undulations of the devotees, but even these are dying out as a type, their speakers presumably entering a state of awe or terror. I can now only hear faint murmuring, and I cannot tell whether or not the whispered responses to this new development are of a positive nature. But the silence carries an ominousness about it that is, in a way, more dreadful than the masses shrieking. I must go and see what has caused the mass to become silent. This could be good, could signal the beginning of the end of this horrible ordeal. Or it could be the start of some greater nightmare, some new level of this surface built hell. I have to go and find out what's going on. I will report back when, if I am able. I hope you all enjoyed the stories for this week. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you stay safe and sound. And as always, stay creepy.